YouTube is launching. I'm going to start webinar and then click record. And good morning. Welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us here today for Showcase 2021. We are going to get started at the top of the hour, but I have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. My name is Caitlin. I'm a member of the Showcase Committee, and I lead the training and education programming here at the Institute. So as we are filtering in here this morning, join the conversation. Introduce yourself using the chat button in Zoom. That's the button that looks like a single uh, speech bubble. Let us know your name your affiliation, where you're calling in from, and something that you're excited to be learning about here at Showcase. If you are joining us on YouTube, there is a single chat feed, so please go ahead and use that and do the same thing. And make sure you're sending, if you're in Zoom, all of your messages to all panelists and attendees. That makes sure that everyone can see your messages. At any point during today's events, you can ask questions of our Team Talk presenters from the Allen Institute and our next generation leaders using the Q&A panel. That's the one that looks like two speech bubbles. So please make sure in your question to include the speaker's name or the talk title of that Team Talk so that we know who that question is gonna be for. You can ask me, for example, when will these talks be recorded and posted and say, this question is for Caitlin. And the answer is that these questions are being, or the this, uh, session is being streamed live to YouTube, so they are available immediately afterwards. Um, and if you are joining us on YouTube live, there isn't a separate chat and Q&A, so you can just go ahead and use that single YouTube chat in order to ask questions. And we'll bring them over here to Zoom and make sure that those get asked of our speakers. If you are having trouble here on Zoom, we recommend trying jumping over to YouTube to, uh, to view. You can click the little button at the top left corner of your Zoom window and view stream on custom live streaming service. That will just send you directly over to YouTube. Or on the login page where you clicked this Zoom link, you can click the YouTube link there as well, or just visit our YouTube channel and it should be popping up for you. If you want to stay here in Zoom, you can also try switching to phone audio to minimize the strain on your internet bandwidth. So here is today's agenda. We're going to be starting with some opening remarks, and then we'll be mixing our team talks and our next generation leader talks throughout the day. So again, thank you, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, symposium, our 2021 showcase symposium. We are going to get started right at the top of the hour, which is nine o'clock here at Pacific time. While we wait for everyone to get started, please do use the chat in Zoom or the chat in YouTube to introduce yourself. Tell us your name, your affiliation, and what you're excited to learn about today. So I'm Caitlin. I lead training and education programming here at the Allen Institute, and I'm a member of the showcase committee. And I am, well, I've seen a lot of these talks already, but I, in the practice sessions, but I'm excited to see the breadth of what has been happening at the Allen Institute over the last year. So please use that chat button that looks like one speech bubble to, uh, to introduce yourself and make sure you're sending those messages to all panelists and attendees. In order to ask questions at any time for both of our, both our team talks and our next generation leaders speakers, Please use that Q&A panel. It's the one that looks like two quotation marks. Getting your questions there is gonna help us make sure that we get those asked of our speakers. Uh, so please make sure that you're including the speaker's name and, uh, or their talk title for the team talks so that we know who those questions are for. So just go ahead and put that right at the beginning of your question that will help us make sure it gets asked of the right person. If you are having trouble, you can switch from Zoom to YouTube by clicking the link in the top left corner or on the login page where you found the Zoom link to join us today. And here is today's agenda. You can find this on the Allen Institute website by clicking on the page for the Showcase Symposium event, which you probably found when you registered for this event. So we are now at the top of the hour, so I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie Seaman, the chair of the Showcase Committee. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our eighth annual showcase symposium. Uh, I'm Stephanie Seaman, a scientist at the Allen Institute for Brain Science and the chair of the showcase committee this year. 
Uh, I want to first start by thanking everyone at the Allen Institute for their contributions to the great science that you will hear about over the course of these two days, and to our late founder, Paul G. Allen, without whom this event, the Institute, and much of our research wouldn't be possible. We are also especially thankful to the phase three employees here at the Institute. Those include RAs, animal care technicians, IT administra administration, and countless others who have kept the wheels of, of team science turning as we navigated another complicated year of mo modified work lives. I'd also like to thank my fellow uh, showcase committee members who have put in uh, more countless hours of work and preparation to put this event together. Uh, Lauren Effler, Yemi Basha, Delissa McMillan, Alice McCora, Ethan McBride, and Kate Roll were essential to organizing and producing all of the team talks you'll hear uh, over these two days. Um, and Saskia DeVries uh, has been great in liaising with the next generation leaders. Wilhelmina Giza, Christina Jarvis, Caitlin Casimo, and the whole uh, communications team uh, is instrumental in keeping us all organized on task uh, and managing all of the behind the scenes actions. Uh, Showcase is a really special event, uh, not only for us at the Institute and you all to hear about the work being done within the walls of the Allen Institute, but also for us to introduce to you our new class of next generation leaders. These six individuals are rising stars in the neuroscience field, and their work highlights the broad scope of neuroscience from microglia interactions with cortical neurons to neural mechanisms, underlying cognition, learning, and development. The 2021 NGLs are Amelia Favuzzi, a postdoctoral fellow in Gord Fischel's lab at Harvard Medical School, Arif Hamid, an assistant professor of neuroscience at the uh, University of Minnesota Medical School, Lucas Pinto, an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Northwestern University, Kanaka Rajan, an assistant professor at the Friedman Brain Institute at the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, Jess Tsai, a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Pediatric Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Yan Wang, who will soon be joining us in Seattle as an assistant professor of psychology and biology at the University of Washington. Every year I'm more impressed by our NGLs than I was the year before, and I expect this year to be no different. Uh, the next generation leaders aren't the only new faces that have been joining the Allen Institute family. Since we began working from home in March of 2020, the neuroscience divisions and the administration that supports us have added 122 new employees. Uh, we were successful in getting about half of them to show up for a group Zoom picture so that we can all see who they are while we sit at our home desk. Welcome to all of you and hopefully soon we can all meet in person. Uh, I'm very excited for our showcase lineup this year uh, and I hope you all enjoy the next two days. We'll hear from all of our new NGLs as well as uh, Cindy Poo, one of our 2020 NGLs who couldn't make it last year. You'll hear five team talks from our RAs, scientists, and engineers representing the Allen Institute for Brain Science and the MindScope program, ranging in topic from the journey of a single cell through our cell types pipeline to how we quantify consciousness. Uh, Alan Jones, the president and CEO of the Allen Institute, will close us out with a retrospective on how Showcase started and has evolved over the last eight years. Finally, I want us all to take a moment to acknowledge that no matter where you are watching from, you are likely on indigenous land. At the Allen Institute, we acknowledge that the land where we do our research is the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The Allen Institute sits on the shore of Lake Union, a body of water important to, to the Duwamish people as a source of food and travel, both historically and today. We honor the Duwamish people's enduring rights to this land and that of indigenous peoples around the world. And we invite you to learn more about the indigenous people where you are at nativeland.ca. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Hong Kui Zhang, the executive vice president and director of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. This year marks Hong Kui's 15 year anniversary with the Allen Institute she has been instrumental in the development and evolution of our high throughput pipelines and the generation of our large scale open access data sets. She will now summarize uh, all of the accomplishments we've had this year. Welcome Han Kui and welcome all of you to 2021 Showcase. Thanks Stephanie. I'll try to control the screen now. Hi everyone, welcome to this um, Showcase Symposium. Um, here, I would like to give you a high-level introduction of neuroscience at the Allen Institute. 
There are three main programs now at the Allen Institute of, uh, with a focus on neuroscience. Uh, there's the Allen Institute for Brain Science, the MindScope program at Allen Institute, as well as the Allen Institute of Neurodynamics. Allen Institute for Brain Science is the oldest institute uh, within the Allen Institute family. It has been around for 18 years now, and currently the main focus of the Brain Science Institute is on understanding the cell type diversity and the connectivity uh, in the mammalian brain. The MindScope program under the leadership of Christoph Koch um, has been at the Institute for over nine years. Uh, the main focus of the MindScope program now is on visually guided behavior as well as consciousness. Um, they, the, the program uses a variety of in vivo uh, imaging and recording technologies to look at the uh, in vivo activities of the different cell types, especially in the uh, mouse visual cortex uh, in awake behaving animals and, and using a computational approach to uh, try to understand the uh, cortical computational mechanisms. Um, the main approaches include uh, in vivo two photon calcium imaging, as well as the uh, large scale uh, electron um, uh, electrophysiology based on the neural pixels probes. They also have a um, open scope program utilizing our in-house large scale um, in vivo imaging and recording pipelines to invite um, external um, academic researchers uh, to collaborate with us in generating standardized uh, large scale uh, data sets to address specific um, uh, circuit uh, function questions. The Ann Institute for Neurodynamics is our uh, newest member uh, of the Ann Institute. It was just launched uh, about a month ago and is being led by Carl uh, Svoboda. The focus of the Institute uh, is on expanding on our study on behavior and circuit function, uh, focusing on different kinds of flexible behavior, including foraging and understanding the learning and decision-making mechanisms behind uh, those uh, behaviors. Um, the team will be investigating a, a large range of brain circuits uh, that include uh, the frontal cortex, the salamus, the basal ganglia, as well as the neuromodulatory systems, again, using a variety of um, um, large-scale uh, high-throughput approaches, including neural pixels-based electrophysiology, um, optical physiology, including both imaging and um, uh, manipulations, uh, and combine that with um, a multi-scale molecular anatomy to uh, relate uh, structural properties of the cell types and circuits with uh, functional properties. And then also uh, using machine learning and uh, theory-based approaches to understand, again, the computational mechanisms uh, of the brain. Given that both the MindScope and Neurodynamics uh, programs uh, are really uh, heavily dependent and, and, and in collaboration with the work at the Brain Science Institute on the understanding of cell types and circuit connectivity, and given that um, our largest neuroscience program is um, in, in this um, cell type and connectivity foundational level, uh, for the remaining of my talk, I'll be mainly focusing on the introduction of our work uh, in those areas in brain science. So the uh, vision of the Brain Science uh, Institute is to uh, generate foundational knowledge about brain cell types and to bridge uh, cell types um, with brain function. And we will do that uh, by discovering and reconstructing the molecular and anatomical architecture of the mammalian brain. And what this entails uh, would be a brain-wide cell type map uh, encompasses uh, the following uh, areas. It will have the molecular genetic identities of all the different cell types uh, in the mammalian brain, uh, the spatial distribution of those cell types across different brain regions and, and the neural systems, the connectivity uh, among those cell types across uh, the brain as well, and uh, generating genetic tools, targeting as many of those cell types um, as possible. We would like to carry out this kind of systematic studies in, across multiple mammalian species, including uh, the mouse, the non-human primate, and the human brain itself. And further, we would like to do that across the 
different ages of the animals from development to aging to understand how the cell types uh, change um, uh, with time and based on the experience of the animal or the person. Through this kind of work, we wish to gain a, a deep understanding of the universal principles of the uh, brain organization um, that's rooted in uh, the cell types, as well as the uh, many potential species specific specializations. And with under this kind of a vision, we have established multiple technology platforms at the, um, at the Brain Science Institute um, that encompass single cell genomics approaches, including single cell RNA seed and single cell ATAC seed. Uh, we build uh, genetic tools uh, based on the knowledge gained from those single cell platforms, uh, and, and that would include um, both uh, transgenic mouse lines as well as enhancer based viral vectors. We, use the, um, um, we also use the spatially resolved transcriptomics technology to um, understand the spatial distribution of the different cell types. Uh, we use the multi-model uh, patch-seq approach to uh, gain um, transcriptomic, morphological, and electrical information from the same cells and to use that multi-model information to define cell types. Furthermore, we uh, connect the molecular identities of the cells and um, their long range projection patterns through the uh, reconstruction of the brain wide full morphologies of the individual projection neurons. We also use the electron microscopy approach to understand the detailed synaptic connections among uh, individual cells and cell types at, at, at extremely high uh, resolution. Going forward in the future, we are also establishing next generation technologies, including barcoded connectomics, as well as large scale uh, uh, light sheet based uh, microscopy to understand uh, brain structure uh, and connectivity um, and a link um, all that information with molecular identities. Um, the, behind all those experimental technology platforms, we also have very strong uh, informatics, data science, and technology capabilities that uh, allows us to uh, manage all the large scale data sets generated from the different platforms uh, and to analyze those data and to manage the data and knowledge and present them in our online public uh, uh, web portals. Here, I just wanted to use two uh, slides highlighting the major accomplishments that we have had uh, over the past year. Um, first of all, uh, our uh, cell types and the connectivity uh, program has now been an integrated part of the community-wide effort in building brain cell atlases, uh, in particular in the NIH Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Um, a major milestone, uh, landmark milestone achieved by BICCN is the uh, publication of a, a large set of papers, uh, 17 research articles in a special uh, BICCN issue of, of Nature. Um, and for this, um, and the Art Institute team has really made major contributions to this um, collective community effort. And that's uh, demonstrated uh, with um, six out of the 17 major publications, which I'm gonna be uh, flying them through here. Uh, the first one is the um, uh, multi-model cell census and atlas of the, mammalian, of the mouse primary motor cortex, um, as well as uh, uh, the same region in human and non-human primate. That's the flagship paper of this publication package. The second is a more detailed transcriptomic and epigenomic atlas of the mouse primary motor cortex. The third study uh, is the comparative analysis of cell types in a motor cortex across three mammalian species. Uh, and the next one is a detailed patch seek study in a surgically resected uh, human uh, cortical uh, tissues uh, in looking at the, the um, specific features of um, glutamatergic neuron types and uh, their um, uh, expansion in a human cortex. Next study showcases a variety of morphological uh, uh, properties of um, uh, molecularly defined neurons in the mouse cortex uh, and other parts of the brain. And finally, a comprehensive 
uh, analysis of the cellular anatomy and connectivity of the mouse primary motor cortex. Beyond the uh, BICCN effort, the Institute has uh, also seen a large number of publications uh, showcasing the uh, a variety of studies that we have done using our multimodal approaches in understanding uh, cell types, uh, their connectivity, and linking that with the cortical function. So here I'm just uh, flashing through the different uh, publications that we have. In, a, in, a, in, a, in all different um, aspects of our program. And uh, with that, I just want to give you a quick sneak peek of what's coming. And here is one slide showcasing a very large set of unpublished data um, that we are actively analyzing now. And you will hear a little bit more about it tomorrow in one of the team talks. And this is marching towards a comprehensive transcriptomic cell type taxonomy across the entire mouse brain. And here showcases a large uh, data set with almost 3 million individual cells, a, a taxonomy covering the entire mouse forebrain uh, um, with 2,000 uh, clusters identified. So with that, I just want to close uh, my introduction by saying that um, we are generating uh, this um, not only large scale data sets, but we are also hoping to extract knowledge uh, about the brain cell types and present that as a public resource to the entire community. This brain-wide cell type uh, map would um, be multidimensional uh, across different mammalian species, across different data modalities, uh, across space to understand the relationship, across the different brain regions and neural systems, and finally across different time uh, to understand the dynamics of cell types. So uh, with that, I want to, again, welcome everybody to this symposium. I hope you will enjoy the talks uh, in the next two days, as well as uh, coming back uh, to hear more about the work at the Ahn Institute uh, through the showcase symposiums in the future years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hankui. It's always uh, sort of overwhelming to see all of that work condensed into a few slides and all that's going on. Um, but without further ado, let's kick things off with our first uh, team talk from the MindScope program, Tiny Blue Dot Team. Uh, their title, talk is titled Seeking the Neural Correlates of Consciousness. Uh, and they're gonna tell us about their work uh, in developing a consciousness meter that can detect a conscious state from brain activity alone and the tests uh, of visual correlates of consciousness and relationships between the claustrum and cortex um, also as it relates to consciousness. So getting right into the deep topics here to start us off. Take it away, Tiny Blue Dot. I'm Christoph Koch, Chief Scientist of the MindScope program. And I'm here to introduce three experiments having to do with the neural mechanisms underlying consciousness. That is the, the neural footprints in the brain of the feeling of seeing, hearing, loving or fearing, these uh, so-called subjective phenomenal feelings that we all take for granted. All this research is funded by the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation out of Santa Monica and endowed by Elizabeth Koch. Our TBD group, screen capture during one of our weekly meetings, has been in operation for three years. I'll be speaking about three experiments. The first relates to the possibility of a conscious meter. That's a device and procedure to test for consciousness in disorder of consciousness patients. These are people that due to trauma, stroke, or other severe brain damage are in a vegetative state, also known as an unresponsive wakefulness state, in which it is very difficult to tell whether anyone is home. Thus, the urgent clinical need to develop a biomarker for consciousness. The second experiment isolates the college of visual con consciousness via masking, a popular two-century-old psychophysical technique that manipulates the visibility of a stimulus such that sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. The vast majority of, of this research is done in humans in which you, uh, you cannot causally intervene in the brain. Sam Gale combines visual masking in the mouth with optogenetics to show paradoxically that inhibiting primary visual cortex can make a mask stimulus visible. Lastly, there is a claustrum, a mysterious structure underneath cortex. Many years ago, Francis Crick and I proposed that the mammalian claustrum is critical to consciousness by acting as a conductor of the cortical symphony. 
Quan Chin Wang will demonstrate the intimate relationship between cortex and claustrum, while Ethan McBride excites claustrum uh, cells using optogenetics and then records from their cortical targets. Let me introduce the first talk on the mouse model of the consciousness meter by Leslie Klar, scientist one in MindScope. Leslie. Thank you, Christoph. As Christoph mentioned, there's a real need for a reliable, objective method to determine whether a person is conscious or not. Specifically in a clinical setting, when patients are unable to tell you or to signal. That led our clinical collaborators to develop an experiment that involves recording neural signals with high density EEG cap, like the one shown here, while perturbing the brain using transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. A TMS device is roughly the size of a ping pong paddle and activates neurons in the cortex non-invasively using magnetic stimulation. When a person is awake, the TMS evokes a widespread and long-lasting response in the EEG signals, shown here. Each line represents a single EEG channel and its average response to hundreds of TMS pulses. Compared to the baseline in black, the response is larger and varies across channels. However, when a person is in deep sleep and therefore unconscious, the response to TMS is different. They use a metric called Perturbational Complexity Index, or PCI, to quantify the complexity of the EEG signals across space, the so different cortical areas, and across time, the hundreds of milliseconds following TMS. PCI is always higher in people that are awake and lower for different states of unconsciousness, such as deep sleep and anesthesia by various anesthetics. So there are three key parts to these experiments. Measure global neuronal signals, perturb the brain, and measure the complexity. Irena, Jacqueline, Kuya, and I developed a mouse version of the human experiments. We perform our experiments in head-fixed mice on a rig similar to the one used by the NeuroPixels team. We use two different recording methodologies. To record more global cortical signals, we use, uh, like in the human experiments, we use a mouse EEG array with 30 electrodes represented by the orange circles that sit on the skull surface. This gives us the ability to record from all of the areas listed here simultaneously. We also record using multiple NeuroPixels probes. Here we show two coronal views of the brain demonstrating that we record from motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, and motor-related thalamic nuclei. Instead of perturbing the brain with TMS, we, use, uh, we directly stimulate the cortical neurons with electrical pulses. Each experiment lasts about two hours. At the beginning, the mouse is awake, free to rest or move on the wheel while we deliver 100 single electrical pulses. After that, we anesthetize the mouse on the wheel with isoflurane. Once the mouse reaches a stable level of anesthesia, we deliver the electrical stimuli a second time. After that, we turn the isoflurane off and deliver the electrical stimuli a third time while the mouse is recovering. This plot shows you the evoked responses on the EEG electrodes when the mouse is awake. The traces are arranged anatomically as the electrodes are over the brain. So these traces come from the left hemisphere, these ones come from the right, and these ones in the front are over the motor cortex where we're actually delivering the stimuli. As you can see, there's a large widespread response across all electrodes in the awake state. Now in this plot, I've collapsed all of the electrodes on top of each other. And here it's easy to appreciate that the signals vary across channels and are also quite variable in time. However, while the mouse is under anesthesia, the response is much simpler. And during recovery, the response is intermediate. Now, if we use perturbational complexity to quantify the responses shown here, 
you see we start out with a high complexity of 65. It drops to 30 in the anesthetized state and comes back to almost 40 during recovery. And we have shown this is true for all our experiments. Our findings match what has been shown in humans, that the complexity is high in conscious states and low in unconscious states. The reason we translated these experiments for use in mice is that we can leverage more invasive techniques, such as recording with NeuroPixels probes, to see what's going on under the hood. Now I'm going to pass it off to Irina to tell you what we see. Thank you, Leslie. So in this plot, you can see the EEG responses on top and the unit responses on the bottom expressed in a Z-score firing rate for different areas such as motor cortex, anterior cingulate, somatosensory cortex, and motor thalamic regions. In this particular example, we stimulated the deep layers of the motor cortex. And following the external electrical stimulation, what we observe is a very short initial activation, which is not really visible in the first few milliseconds, followed by a profound silence of 150, 180 milliseconds, and then a rebound response in the motor cortex where we stimulate and the motor thalamus. This dynamic is not present when the animal is anesthetized. If we stimulate the superficial layers of the motor cortex, what we observe is the very first excitation follow the inhibition, but only on the cortex that receives the stimulation. And again, this dynamic is not present when the animal is anesthetized. These differences in the unit activity translate to differences in the dynamics of the EEG signals. And these differences are captured by the PCI, by the PCI measurements. So in both cases, the PCI is higher in a wake state. And we see the highest complexity when we stimulate the deeper layer of the motor cortex. So moving towards the mechanism, our first observation is that the baseline firing rate decreases under anesthesia in all recorded areas. Our second observation is about the relative timing of the evoked responses when we are stimulating the deeper layer of the motor cortex, which most likely is directly activating layer five cortical thalamic neurons. When we look at the latency to the first spike, <clears throat> we see um, a clear evidence that the motor cortex precedes the motor thalamus by around five milliseconds in the very first uh, excitation. And the order is reversed when we look at the second activation or rebound activity, where in this case, the motor cortex follows the motor thalamus by around five milliseconds. This relationship is no longer there when the animal is anesthetized, most likely because it is more difficult to elicit a strong response in the same areas. So to summarize, when the animal is awake and we stimulate the deep layers of the motor cortex, we think that the electrical stimulation triggers a local excitation in the cortex and a few milliseconds later in the thalamus. This triggers a 150-180 millisecond uh, long inhibition of thalamic and cortical responses, followed by a rebound. And this is common across all our 25 subjects we recorded so far. Interesting, even the locomotion affects the cortical thalamic interactions. In fact, by discriminating the awake trials based on the movement, we observe that uh, the late component of the EEG signal are reduced when the animal is moving. And this is also reflected in the unit responses where the initial activation, the inhibition and the rebound activity are also reduced in magnitude when the animal is moving compared when the animal is resting. Again, the PCI is capturing these differences. 
whether the PCI in a wake state is higher than the PCI in an anesthetized state independently by locomotion. And this is true for all our mice. So this unique setup allows the investigation of the underlying mechanism uh, in different brain states in mice, which ultimately can inform the use of PCI in humans. Now, I would like to leave the stage to Sam Gale, scientist three in MindScope, who will tell us about another project under the same umbrella of understanding the mechanisms underlying consciousness, which is, which is focused on how to make a visual stimulus visible by inhibiting the visual cortex. Backward visual masking with the visibility of one stimulus called the target is impaired by subsequent presentation of a second stimulus, the mask, has been used for centuries to probe the timing and mechanisms of conscious and unconscious perception in humans. In the example shown here, a target image is presented briefly and followed by a mask after a variable interval. In this experiment, subjects report whether there was an animal in the image or not, which they do very accurately unless the interval between the target and the mask is less than 50 milliseconds. For the shortest interval between the target and mask, performance is barely above the chance level of 50%, and subjectively, the target image is not visible. There are a variety of models that attempt to explain how a mask presented after the target retroactively makes the target in invisible, but these models are difficult to test mechanistically in humans. To fill this gap, we developed a task for mice that we hoped would induce backward visual masking. In this tar task, a target is presented for 17 milliseconds on the left or right side of the screen, and the mouse turns a steering wheel, right or left respectively, to earn a drop of water. On some trials, the target is followed by mask stimuli on both sides of the screen after a variable interval. When there is no mask, mice properly report target location on greater than 90% of trials. However, when a mask is presented within 50 milliseconds of the onset of the target, discrimination of target location is impaired. For the shortest interval, 17 milliseconds, when the mask is presented immediately after the target, accuracy is only slightly better than chance. Thus, the performance of mice during this task is very similar to the performance of humans during mask backward visual masking. To explore the mechanisms of this phenomenon, begin by asking whether mask evoked activity in visual cortex is responsible for making the target invisible. To do this, we combined the shortest and most effective interval between the target and mask, 17 milliseconds, with bilateral optogenetic inhibition of visual cortex at variable times. On trials with no inhibition of visual cortex, the mask is maximally effective and performance is near chance, as shown on the previous slide. When cortex is inhibited, inhibited before a visual response occurs in cortex at about 40 milliseconds, mice do not respond at all because the response to the target is blocked, so there's no measurement of accuracy, shown here. Strikingly, however, when cortex is inhibited at a time that preserves the initial response to the target, but blocks the response to the mask, behavioral ac accuracy is restored proportionally to how early mask evoked spiking is inhibited. And for the earliest time of cortical inhibition, when most of the response of the mask is prevented, accuracy is similar to when the ma no mask is presented at all. Thus, mask evoked activity in visual cortex underlies the backward visual masking effect, and blocking this activity effectively masks the mask. I would now like to introduce Quan Chen Wang, principal scientist in the Allen Institute for Brain Science, who will show us data that reveal the unique connectivity pattern of the classroom. Thanks, Sam. Today, I'm going to talk about a regional and a serotype specific connection of the mouse colostrum. The colostrum uh, here is a, a thin, a small, 
elongate sheet-like structure located between the insular cortex and the striatum. Based on its widespread and reciprocal connection with the cortex, Francis Crick and Chris, Christoph Koch proposed that the mobility uh, claustrum is critical to consciousness by acting as a conductor of the cortical symphony. Recent studies have systematically investigated the input out of the connection of the mouse claustrum. Uh, despite a general similarity, this report are inconsistent regarding the presence or absence of some input and output or projection of the claustrum. A cort cortical pyramidal neurons are classified into three major serotypes, IT neurons in layer two to six, ET neurons in layer five, CT neurons in layer six. However, what cortical serotypes project to mouse claustrum remains largely unknown. Claustrum principal neurons send projection to different combination of cortical target to further reveal their projection diversity as necessary to reconstructing more individual claustrum neurons. In this study, we systematically uh, analyze single neuron tracing data, anti-grade uh, dependent AV injection data, and retrograde rabies injection data. The claustrum injection all made in the, on the right side. Here is a, a flat map of the isocortex. On the left side, you can see all 46 cortical area are la labeled. On the right side, you can see uh, six modules are color coded differently. Here are five examples of the retrograde repeat injection into the right side of the claustrum. So it's like a butterfly shape. The main retrograde labeled neurons are labeled in prefrontal and later module, as well as later labeled in the sensory and the media module. Uh, in this slide, I show four injections with AAV into the uh, right side of the claustrum. You can see the labeling pattern are very similar to each other. So, the claustrum cortical projection uh, predominantly to a pre prefrontal module and a later module. You can see a weak projection to somatosensory cortex and auditory cortex. Here, by injecting, by uh, tracing individual claustrum neurons, you can see the diversity or the claustrum projection neurons. It can be uh, classified into bilateral projection neuron and ipsilateral projection neurons. By integrating all this data set, we build a wiring, wiring diagram of the input-output connection of the mouse claustrum. The cortical claustrum cortical loops and subcortical claustrum cortical networks may play an important role in higher cognitive functions. I would like to introduce the final speaker, Ethan McElroy, scientist one in MindScope. Ethan will tell us about what happens to cortical neurons after optogenetically stimulating the claustrum neurons. Thank you, Panshin. As Christoph alluded to earlier, despite the claustrum's widespread projections to many cortical areas, the function of those projections has largely remained a mystery. In the last few years, there has been some work showing a primarily feed-forward inhibitory effect of claustrum on prefrontal cortex in mice. Here I'm showing claustrum in bright green and prefrontal cortex in blue. However, this and other studies recorded from relatively few neurons and exclusively from frontal cortical areas. We know from Quanshin's work that 
claustrum also projects very strongly to medial cortical areas, such as anterior cingulate and retroscalenial cortex. Thus, our objective for this project was to characterize the function of claustrum projections to its widespread targets in the cortex. With NeuroPixels probes available, we had the capability to record from a very large number of neurons and characterize the effect of claustrum across multiple cortical areas. With the help of Jackie Kuyat, we implanted optical fibers into the GNB4 AI32 transgenic mouse, which expresses channel rhodopsin in the same claustrum cells characterized by Quanchin and others. Shining light onto these neurons causes them to strongly increase their activity. Here is a histology image showing the optic fiber implant above claustrum. We then recorded with up to three neuropixels probes simultaneously while optogenetically activating the claustrum for 500 milliseconds. Here is a histology image of an example probe track. And here is a plot of the locations of the neurons we recorded on a sagittal view of the mouse brain atlas. Now I'm going to show you some movies. Overall, we found that optogenetically exciting the claustrum for 500 milliseconds produced strong activation of many cortical neurons. Here, the neurons are plotted on a sagittal section of the mouse brain atlas. Each point is one neuron, colored according to its normalized firing rate. On the left, I'm showing only those cortical neurons that were significantly excited by claustrum activation. You'll see at the point that the stimulation turns on, what looks like a wave of activity travels from the front to the back of the brain, which is consistent with the known axonal projections of claustrum neurons. I'll replay this a couple more times. Note the wave of activity. On the right, I'm showing the cortical neurons that were inhibited. The effect here is not as strong, but the fact that there are both many excited and inhibited neurons demonstrates that the effect of claustrum on cortical neurons is more complex and varied than previously thought. How does this bear out in the numbers? Here I'm showing the fraction of neurons that were significantly affected, broken down into different categories. Purple shows regular spiking cells, which are putative excitatory cells based on their action potential waveform. Green shows fast spiking cells, which are putative inhibitory. Bars above zero show the fraction of cells excited by optostimulation, while bars below zero show the fraction inhibited in the cortex. You'll notice that the more putative inhibitory cells tend to be affected. This is consistent with previous work showing that claustrum projection neurons connect most strongly to interneurons. Finally, the different columns here show the fraction affected in different areas. If you focus on the relative balance between excited and inhibited cells, you can see that there is a trend from the frontal to the posterior areas. In retrosplenal cortex, or RSP, there's much more excitation than inhibition. If we break this down in a different way, by cortical layer, we also see an interesting trend. Neurons in layer 2-3 are much more likely to be excited than inhibited, while more neurons are inhibited in the deeper layers, particularly in layer 6. This work adds to the growing evidence that the function of claustrum is more heterogeneous than previously thought. Moving forward, it will be important for the field to separately study the classroom projections to specific cortical areas and layers, because they may very well have different and unique functions. I and the other speakers would like to thank all of the people and groups listed here for supporting these projects with their time and effort. We also thank the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation for the funding that made all of these experiments possible our founder, Paul G. Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. And we thank all of you for your attention.
Thank you to the tiny blue dot team. Um, I think we can have time for one of the questions that's come in uh, for Leslie and Arena. Um, they say it's from Yvette Fisher, a beautiful talk uh, in this study. I'm curious how you explore the possibility for differences in non-locomotor motor behaviors between the awake and anesthetized state. Yeah, so, um, well, um, the animal is on the wheel. So we record uh, the movement of the animal and, when it, and sometimes some animals move and run and some others, and sometimes they rest. So all of the comparison that we do when we do awake versus anesthetize are focused on when the animal is not moving. So we don't record essentially uh, movement from the wheel. And then since we have uh, some uh, trials that are left out from uh, the wake in the, during the wake state, which are due when the animal is moving, then uh, we essentially are able to also analyze those uh, uh, trials and uh, essentially look at uh, what are the differences in the evoked activity. Great, thank you. Um, there's a few more questions um, and we'll let your team uh, continue to answer those and type out answers um, and we'll continue on. Thank you, Tiny Blue Dot. Uh, great talk for kicking us off. Um, we'll now have our first uh, NGL talk, um, Amelia Favuzzi. Amelia is a postdoctoral fellow uh, in Gord Fischel's lab at Harvard Medical School and the Broad Institute. Her presentation, GABA receptive microglia selectively sculpt developing inhibitory circuits, uh, where she'll discuss her work using single cell RNA-seq, MRFish, and selective microglial ablation to study the role of microglia in the postnatal development of inhibitory cortical circuits. Uh, welcome, Amelia. Uh, all right. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this year's NGL cohort. I'm really looking forward to interacting with the Allen community and hopefully in the future, seeing you on Duwamish land in Seattle at some point in the future. Um, so I'm interested in under understanding how the establishment of brain architecture contributes to function and uh, behavior. So I'm excited to share with you some of the work that I did during my postdoc showing that the selective communication between neuronal and glial cell types contributes to uh, those processes. Okay. So imagine you ask these two people to learn a new language, who will learn it faster and uh, better. Well, likely the kid at the top. And why? Because her brain is at this stage here when neurons are forming synapses at a very high speed. And then this is followed by a period of synapse pruning where the brain gets rid of all the extra connections. And as a result of that, the remaining wiring is more refined and more efficient. And that's why when a connection is used repeatedly during development, it then becomes uh, permanent. And an additional reason is that defects in synapse pruning have been associated with a number of neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism or schizophrenia. So synapse pruning is needed for normal, precise brain wiring, but what does regulate pruning? Well, in addition to several neuronal intrinsic mechanisms, so work from many labs over the last years has shown that glial cells, astrocytes, and microglia critically contribute to this process. So what are microglia? Microglia are the brain immune cells. They have this really ramified morphology and they continuously survey their environment. And until relatively recently, it was thought that microglia would just be there, become activated in response to tissue damage or infection, and essentially clean up toxins or dead neurons. And that's, of course, still true. But now we know that uh, microglia also play a number of non-inflammatory functions during normal uh, brain development, including the regulation of synapse pruning. So just to give you a simplified background about what we know, um, there's two main steps of microglia-mediated pruning of synapses. And the first step, um, so-called fan me signals, uh, like chemokines or ATP, are released from neurons and bind to receptors expressed in microglia. And then in the second step, molecular tags known as ITMI signals will be key for the recognition and engulfment of less active uh, synapses. 
But synapses are not really how I depicted them here. They're more like this, um, heterogeneous. And that is true at both the molecular and at the functional level. And the best example of this is the dichotomy between excitatory and uh, inhibitory synapses. So when we think about the role of microglia and synapse pruning, we really don't know whether they are genetic effectors of synapse pruning or if they can discriminate between distinct types of um, synapses. So in this work, we explore the hypothesis that functional microglia diversity has evolved to ensure pruning of inhibitory versus uh, excitatory synapses. And we can really break this down in three specific questions. First, do microglia regulate the development of the inhibitory circuits? And if that's the case, then what are the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms? And is there any specificity? And third, what happens at the behavioral level if we disrupt um, their interaction? So starting with the first question, what I mentioned about microglia-mediated pruning was studied with uh, excitatory synapses. So we didn't even know whether microglia would regulate the development of inhibitory um, synapses. And so we started with a relatively blunt tool. We depleted microglia for the first two postnatal weeks in mice using a pharmacological strategy. And as you can see here, the strategy is very efficient. There's virtually no microglia left in the cortex. And that is true from P4 throughout development until P15, when we stop our depletion protocol and looked at what happened to the cortical circuits. And today I will mainly focus on uh, parvalbumin positive uh, synapses for the inhibitory circuits and thalamic inputs as a comparison for uh, the excitatory circuits and uh, the work that we did in the somatosensory cortex. So like I mentioned, we depleted microglia and first looked at excitatory synapses and consistent with previous work, we found that they were increased in uh, microglia depleted mice, both structurally and uh, functionally. But we also found a similar increase in inhibitory uh, synapses. And again, both structurally and using uh, physiology. And we also confirmed this functional increase specifically for parvalbumin um, circuits using optogenetics. So we expressed channel rhodopsin in PV cells stimulated them and recorded from excitatory neurons, and we found a higher response in uh, microglia depleted mice. And I wanted to highlight that actually this uh, effect was only observed after P12, uh, so after the initial assembly of inhibitory synapses, suggesting that microglia play a role in the maturation, refinement, rather than the formation of these um, synapses. Now, in my introduction, I mentioned that um, Brain development is an exceptionally sensitive time window and even subtle insults can cause alterations that will last throughout life. And that's why we ask, so what happens if you let uh, microglia repopulate the brain after P15, will the synapses catch up? And here you can see that the depleted brains are indistinguishable from the control at P30, so microglia do repopulate the brain. But when we look at the synapses, that hyperconnectivity defect is still there, indicating that depleting microglia during development causes long-lasting defects in uh, inhibitory synapses. So uh, the next question was, is all this due to a direct interaction of microglia with inhibitory synapses? And to answer this question, we labeled PV synapses uh, that you will see in red using adeno-associated viruses that express in atophysin TD tomato under the control of a PV-specific enhancer. And we injected those viruses in mice with uh, genetically labeled uh, microglia. And we found that the processes of microglia contacted those uh, PV synapses wrapped around them, like in these examples. And actually, a subset of those was completely encapsulated within microglia, as assessed by super resolution microscopy, and colocalized with microglial isosomes, suggesting uh, engulfment. But perhaps even more interestingly, those contacts were developmentally regulated. So there was an increase between P12 and P15, then the highest number at P15, P17, and then they decreased again uh, at P30. This was just a screenshot, and so we wanted to look at the dynamics of those uh, interactions. And so we used exactly the same labeling tools that I just described and did in vivo to photon imaging of microglia, PV synapse interactions in layer four of the somatosensory cortex, and we did that at the peak contact period, P15, uh, P17. And for example, this is a microglia that over a period of uh, 30 minutes 
really contacts the majority of the synapses um, around. So it was contacted once on the left and moves to the bottom, almost to the right. So that's three synapses that moves to this top region. And then extend the process and goes back to the to the bottom. So when we do this for several cells and several animals, we can really get an idea of what happens on average. And the first thing that we noticed was a bimodal behavior of microglia. There was a first group of cells that almost avoided or contacted very few PV synapses, and a second group of cells that contacted the majority uh, of PV synapses, around up to 60, 70 percent of them. And we also found that within this population that didn't care much about inhibitory synapses, the interactions that did occur had a significantly shorter duration as compared to the interactions within this uh, population that was more actively engaged with uh, inhibitory synapses. So then we thought, is there a signaling that might mediate these different interactions? And so to answer that, we might publish transcriptional data to identify ligand receptor pairs that were selectively expressed in inhibitory neurons, but not excitatory neurons and microglia uh, during development. And we found that among the top candidates, the GABA-GABA-B receptor pairs. Now, this actually has a strong uh, precedent in addition to its role as a neurotransmitter, GABA acts as a paracrine signal to regulate several developmental processes like progenitor proliferation, neuronal migration, synapse formation, and most of those um, are actually dependent on GABA-B uh, receptors. On the other side, previous work in the adult had shown that a subset of microglia uh, express GABA-B receptors, and they can actually respond to GABA, for instance, by changing their uh, motility. So the first thing that we did was to confirmed that a P15 in the somatosensory cortex, around 20% of microglia express both GABA-B receptor subunits. And then we found that uh, these uh, P inhibitory synapses were preferentially contacted by GABA receptive microglia, whereas the opposite was true for excitatory synapses. They were preferentially contacted by microglia that did not express GABA-B receptors. So then we removed GABA-B receptors from microglia specifically using two distinct pre-driver lines. And we found that these knockout cells contacted significantly less PV inhibitory synapses, but there was no change in the proportion of excitatory synapses contacted by the knockout microglia. So then we went back to our in vivo to photon imaging experiments. And uh, this is the bimodal distribution that I showed you earlier for the control. So we did the same thing in the knockout and we found that in the knockout, the interactions were no longer bimodal and actually more closely resemble those that interact less with uh, PV synapses. And so we stopped here and we thought, oh, it might look like these GABA receptive microglia uh, may be dedicated to remodel inhibitory synapses. But then, if that is the case, these knockout mice should have connectivity defects that are somehow similar to what we found when we had completely um, depleted microglia, right? And what we found was quite remarkable. Again, we went back, to, we looked at the inhibitory synapses in GABA-B knockout mice, and we found that they were increased structurally and functionally using PCLG. So what this shows is that removing GABA-B from microglia only, phenocopies that effect on inhibitory synapses that we had seen when we had completely uh, depleted microglia. But then when we looked at the excitatory, sorry, excitatory synapses, we found no effect. And so what this means is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia also decouples that effect on inhibitory versus excitatory synapses that we had seen in the depleted mice. So then we wanted to know the uh, downstream mechanisms. Uh, and for that, we isolated microglia from the somatosensory cortex of P15 control and GABA-B knockout mice and did um, single cell RNA sequencing. And here you can see that control and knockout cells align pretty well. They segregate in eight mixed clusters. And of course, I won't go into the details of what these clusters are, but the, an important message here is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia doesn't fundamentally alter the range of microglial states that can be observed. So then within each of these mixed clusters, we compared control and um, knockout cells, and we found that the cluster where they were more different was this cluster four. Now, 
Cluster 4 contains microglia that express higher levels of what is known as homeostatic microglia core genes, the more mature microglia. And we then looked at the identity of those differentially expressed genes within um, cluster 4. And we found that they were broadly involved in pruning. When I say broadly involved in pruning, what I mean is that they included classical um, pruning genes, but also genes involved in motility, migration, cell cell adhesion, uh, and phagocytosis. So, so it was really not one or two genes that were changes, it was a whole program that was different. But since we had a uh, single cell resolution, of course, we could see that those downregulated genes were downregulated only in a specific subset of microglia, around 25, 20 to 25% of them, and those same microglia actually segregate as a transcriptionally distinct subcluster within cluster four. And so of course the question at that point was, are these um, GABA receptive microglia? Unfortunately, we couldn't answer this question using single cell RNA-seq because the expression of GABA B receptors in microglia is very low. And so we had a lot of dropout events and an incomplete detection of GABA receptive microglia. But to answer this question, we used uh, more fish profiling. There is a hybridization based um, spatial transcriptomic technique. And so we did that in the control and GABA B knockout mice. And for example, when we cluster those cells, if you focus here on this, cluster four and cluster four um, GG. These again are microglia that express higher levels of homeostatic microglia core genes. So they're similar to the um, cluster four microglia that I showed you earlier for the single cell RNA-seq. But now we could also distinguish those that express GABA B receptors here and of course also in other clusters. And since we had spatial information, we could also see that uh, in general, GABA receptive microglia are interspersed um, in the cortex among the negative cells, and they are uniformly distributed across uh, cortical layers. But then we went back to those genes that we had seen, some of those that were downregulated in uh, the single cell RNA seq. And sure enough, they were also downregulated using more fish. And uh, um, sorry. And uh, but here we could see that the they were specifically downregulated in this cluster four GG and so GABA receptive microglia from cluster four, not another cluster four cells, and not another GABA receptive microglia within other clusters. And so what this shows is that those transcriptional changes that we had seen were really observed within GABA receptive microglia. So then the last question is: was, Are there any behavioral consequences when we disrupt the interaction between microglia and inhibitory? synapses. And to answer this question, we used MOSIC or uh, motion sequencing that was developed by the data lab at Harvard Medical School and allows unsupervised analysis of mouse uh, behavior. And it's really based on the idea that behavior is composed of specific motifs called syllables in MOSIC, like a specific type of run or a rear. And they all come together following a specific structure to produce um, continuous behavior. And so when we looked at the usage of syllables, I'm not sure this is me, apologize. Um, we found that the knockout down upregulated syllables associated with different types of running or grooming and downregulated syllables associated with different types of uh, pausing behavior. And here, for example, you have a, a run that is upregulated in the mutants and this is uh, grooming. And more generally, we also found that these knockout mice had a higher locomotor activity, indicating a general hyperactivity in GABA B uh, conditional knockout mice. And finally, when we looked at these state maps where the nodes are the different syllables and the edges are the transitions between them, um, we found that Knockout mice essentially downregulate the majority of these transitions between syllables, and they mainly oscillate between this repetitive running and, and, and grooming and downregulate the rest of the, uh, the behaviors. And so to summarize what I show you, we have seen that pitting development GABA binds to GABA B receptors on GABA receptive microglia, and it activates a synapse remodeling program that will change motility, cell cell adhesion, phagocytosis. And as a result of that, those cells contact more and more inhibitory synapses over development. And that is why if you remove all uh, microglia, like in the depletion, you'll have 
and increasing both inhibitory and excitatory synapses. But if you selectively remove GABA-B receptors from microglia, you will only affect inhibitory uh, synapses. And we have seen that these defects will persist throughout the life of the animal and will ultimately impact um, behavior. And so the main implication of this work is that um, it suggests that brain wiring and potentially function relies on the selective communication between matched neuronal and glial cell types. And so some of the questions that I hope to answer in the future as I establish my own lab include really understanding the synapse-specific mechanisms that underlie this selectivity, but also try to understand whether this is a general principle by looking at other subtypes of neurotransmitter receptive microglia. And this is all during development. I'm also interested in understanding how far does this go are the same principles and molecules also redeployed later in experience dependent plasticity, um, learning and regulating effective brain um, function. And this was a real team effort. I have a lot of people to thank, I want to thank, of course, Gord Fischel, who has been an extremely supportive uh, supervisor, and a number of people in the Fischel lab who were really key for this work. I was also lucky to mentor a number of very talented and dedicated uh, undergraduate students. And in particular, I wanted to highlight Bonnie and Ajoa, who were really key and very dedicated uh, over the years. I want to thank our um, collaborators, Beth Stevens, who's been there since the beginning with feedback, advice, sharing mice. Uh, more recently, uh, like Karen and Sami, who were fantastic collaborators for the Morphish um, experiments. And finally, Bob Data and Ayman, who were great collaborators for the uh, MOSIC behavioral experiments, but also very invested in discussing the whole uh, project. And finally, all the people who shared uh, mice and um, reagents with us. And thank you. Thanks so much, Amelia. Great talk. Um, always interesting to hear stuff beyond the typical cortical neurons and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so we've got a few questions coming in the, in the Q and A. Um, so we'll just hop right in. Um, and actually Forrest Coleman has one that um, I had as well. Um, and he says, I'm curious whether you think the cell type specificity of microglia might get finer than just GABA versus non-GABA in particular do the GABA receptor one and receptor two expressing microglia preferentially interact with different interneuron subclasses. So subclass for us at the Allen Institute means like PV, SST, VIP. Um, get yes, into that. I mean, of course, that is that is a question that I, I also had. And I have to say, I have looked at the majority of those classes and this overall picture is very interesting because there are differences. So for example, um, we do see an effect on SST, somatostatin uh, interneurons, but on a follow-up of that work we are doing in collaboration with the Karayanis lab at Zurich, uh, we are seeing that that is more related to the axonal branches, so perhaps it's really not the same mechanism. Right. But then even more interestingly, for example, VIP synapses are completely not affected, which means, of course, brings another question like our in general, VIP synapses pruned or they're not pruned, and that might be related to the different uh, um, circuit role of VIP synapses. And then just to shoot another one, uh, the uh, PVPV synapses. So I showed PV pyramidal cell synapses, and I was very surprised when I saw the PVPV synapses are not affected. So the, I think there is a lot of heterogeneity there, um, and I'm definitely interested in unpacking that too. Yeah, well, seems like there's a lot to explore there. So good. Uh... Good work to continue on. Um, we've got a question from some of our YouTube audience. Um, uh, have you investigated a possible relationship with synapse pruning and circadian rhythm with special focus on sleep deprived mice? I haven't. Um, I mean, if, if there's someone who wants, I'm very interested in doing that, not only because it has been shown that micro, for those who are not familiar with this, that uh, the activity of microglia is different depending on the um, sleep wake cycle. They are mm -hmm. more active uh, during sleep. And in general, of course, you can mimic that with anesthesia. And so I think, I'm, I think that, of course, has big implications for learning and memory. And my, one of my questions is what happens? Are they interacting with inhibitory synapses preferentially? overnight, let's say, over the sleep cycle. I, I'm definitely questions that I want to follow up, but I still don't know. Yeah, cool. Um, another question from uh, Ben Slivka. Um, why do you chart males versus females separately in your MoSeq analysis? 
Good question. Um, the original reason was because, again, for those who are not familiar, that there have been reports of uh, differences in microglia depending on sex. And so the, I, we thought it was important to separate those. In all those analyses, I have to say, we hadn't seen a striking difference. So all phenotypes were the same in males and females. And so that's why we could pull them. Um, for MOSIC, the main phenotype, I have to say, is the, is the same. It's just that what we realized later is that behavior when analyzed with that type of unsupervised uh, uh, analysis is slightly different in males and females. And so uh, it, it increased the variability. They use the usage of syllables, for example, is slightly different in males and females. But I really want to highlight, I don't think there is a sex specific effect of GABA B removal. I think there is an, a similar effect of GABA B removal on what is a biologically different substrate. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, and then one last question for now is, um, is the overactive synapses that create the overgrowth uh, allowing for increased susceptibility for synesthesia? Not quite sure. We could ask for more clarity if you need, but. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's yeah. a typo or some auto correction. We, uh, we can work with that offline and uh, have a typed answer. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Amelia. That was a great talk. And um, thank you. yeah, looking forward to more microglia discussions. So um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. If folks want to take maybe a two second, two minute break, uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes for our next team talk, uh, cell type cards. Okay, we'll get going here with our uh, next uh, team talk from the uh, Cell Types Cards uh, team, uh, looking at a new tool that they've made, the Cell Types Explorer. Um, it allows us to look at a multimodal presentation of cell type characterization um, and consolidates the current knowledge on cell types and enables researchers to match their data to these defined cell types. Uh, this effort was part of the Allen Institute's involvement in the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, the BICCN, 
um, and a collaborative effort to develop a comprehensive atlas of the mam mammalian brain. Um, I'm really excited to see uh, this new tool and excited for you all to learn about it as well. Uh, here's the Cell Types Explorer. Today, we're going to give a team talk titled Creation of Cell Types Explorer for presenting multimodal features of cell types. My name is Jeremy Miller, and I'll be presenting alongside Ray Sanchez, Amaka Yadav, and Lydia Nuk. So I will start with an introduction to the BICCN Mini Atlas project. Ray will then give a presentation on the content development. Ambika will then talk about, provide a demo for the Cell Types Explorer, as well as the development process. And then Lydia will um, discuss what's coming next. All right, so the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, or BICCN Mini Atlas Project, is a comprehensive characterization uh, and census of cell types in the primary motor cortex of human, non-human, primate, and mouse. In total, more than 3 million cells were profiled using a variety of modalities that are shown here and that we will discuss for the remainder of this talk. More than 200 terabytes of data and their associated analysis tools were collected and are being made freely available. And this project is summarized in a flagship paper published in Nature. What we'll be presenting here is the culmination of work from the Allen Institute and from many other collaborators as part of the BICCN. So some of the key findings, uh, the first was uh, we created a molecular taxonomy of cell types in mouse. Um, this is what's shown on the top here. Uh, there were a number of non-neuronal and neuronal cell types, including glutamatergic types from multiple cortical layers and GABAergic types from different developmental origins. And in addition, uh, MERFISH was used to spatially localize these cell types, um, which is what's shown below. Um, here's an example showing the IT neurons, which show very um, strong layer uh, specification for, for these types. In addition, the epigenetic and gene regulatory signatures of these molecular types were characterized. Below is showing an example for the NFIX gene um, with two uh, different GABAergic types uh, for gene expression, open chromatin, and DNA, and DNA methylation. In yellow are showing two example enhancers, um, which were both identified in human, and only one of them seems to be conserved in mouse. In addition, uh, the BICCN uh, groups were able to link electrophysiology and morphology to these uh, neuronally defined, or sorry, to these um, cell types defined based on gene expression. Um, this row here shows the names from these patch seek and connectivity studies, um, along with some example morphologies for these different types. And there's a quite wide variety of the way they look and, and kind of where they're located. Um, in addition, there was conservation of these types that was found between human, marmoset, and mouse, along with species specializations. What's shown here is an example of the about 45 conserved types that were found between species. Um, and they share a, a lot of common features in terms of their, you know, the genes that are expressed, the kind of the number of differentially expressed genes between types and the number of, of clusters identified within these types. And then finally, there were a, a several papers that um, discussed the connectivity and uh, projection maps of these motor cortex neurons. On the left is an overview panel of projections to the motor cortex based on retrogradely labeled neurons. And then on the right over here, there's some examples of full neuron morphology. Uh, and you can see that the uh, neurons that are IT and layer five have very different projection targets from the layer five ET neurons. Now, all of this, along with the flagship paper, um, was, was published together in 17 studies um, from 250 researchers across uh, 45 institutions. Um, and a collection of these studies is available in Nature at the website shown here. This is a lot of dense information um, to synthesize. And so we wanted to create a Cell Types Explorer web application to consolidate this knowledge and the data about the cell types in the primary motor cortex. We also want the Cell Types Explorer to be um, to a one-stop shop for access to the BICCN uh, primary motor cortex data analysis and tools. Um, we hope that we can empower researchers to map their data to the um, BICCN references. 
And um, we also hope that this product will act as a blueprint for extension to cell types in other brain regions and organ systems. And so now I will hand it over to Ray to talk about the content development for the Cell Type Explorer tool. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, my name is Ray Sanchez, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, the content that's in the Cell Types Explorer. So how do we go about creating a web application like this? Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, there's a lot of dense information to synthesize here, and we wanted this to be a, a nice summary of all of the information that was gathered as part of the BICCN effort. So the first step in this was to hold a series of what we call deep dive meetings, which essentially um, was where we brought together experts in specific domains to decide what sort of data display and how to display it. Once we decided the, the content that we wanted to display in the Cell Types Explorer, um, we had to collect that data and create data visualizations based on that expert feedback. Um, and then we worked with the engineering teams, who you'll hear from in a second, um, on those data visualizations and sort of had to decide what would work and what wouldn't. Once we were happy with the content that we created, um, we turned this over along with the code used to make that content as well as relevant metadata to the engineering teams to populate the Cell Types Explorer with. Uh, and then finally, the engineering team established a prototype that was used to collect uh, some user feedback, which then enabled us to go back and refine a lot of the visualizations and functionalities. So where does all this data come from? Um, there's a lot of different modalities that Jeremy already highlighted as part of uh, the BICCN. And to, to make all of the content on cell type cards, we really drew from three primary sources that were established as part of BICCN. Uh, so this first was the NEMO archives, which hosts um, raw and processed omics data, so uh, transcriptomics and epigenomics data. We uh, pulled morphology data from the brain image library, and all of the electrophysiology information is hosted at uh, the Dandy archives. So this really highlights uh, another way in which the Cell Types Explorer can serve as sort of a one-stop shop for access to all of this BICCN data. So Jeremy showed this image before, uh, and this is the hierarchy of cell types in the mouse primary motor cortex. Um, and you can imagine that if you aren't looking, aren't used to looking at images like this, this can be sort of difficult to navigate. Um, so I'll kind of briefly explain what's going on here, as this is the basis for navigating the Cell Types Explorer. So the highest level of the taxonomy here, we have uh, what we call classes of cell types. Um, so these are very low resolution groupings of cell types at the highest level of, of the hierarchy. Uh, in the middle, we have subclasses of cell types. So these are, are what you see here. Um, and these are slightly finer resolutions of cell types. And then at the highest resolution, um, we have cell types here at the bottom. So even with this information, uh, you can imagine that if you wanted to view this on a web application, it would be sort of hard to click and, and navigate through this. Um, so to address this, we instead represent that same hierarchy uh, as part of what we call a sunburst plot. So this is the same information on the previous slide uh, displayed slightly differently. So in this inner ring, we have uh, cell classes. In the middle ring, uh, cell subclasses. And then on the outer ring, we have cell types. So as Amika will show you soon, clicking on any one of these panels in the sunburst plot will take you to an individual cell type card which is where all of the data uh, about a given cell type is summarized and displayed. And the focus of each cell type card will really be uh, on comparing individual cell types to what we call their sibling types, which is essentially just the, the cell types that are most closely related to it in the taxonomy. So now I'll briefly walk through the different data modalities displayed on each cell type card. So first, we display information about gene expression. Um, so this is an example dot plot of one of seven RNA-seq data sets showing different marker genes um, for focus here on the LAMP5 type um, in relationship to its sibling types. And users can select between uh, any of the seven RNA-seq data sets as part of the uh, mouse motor cortex taxonomy. In addition, we also display key cluster metrics, such as number of genes detected and UMIs to give sort of more context to these RNA-seq data. 
we show UMAP visualizations, which are essentially 2D representations of this high dimensional data space. So by default, we show a given cell type um, and its location in the neighborhood of cell types here shown in the UMAP plot. But you can also display uh, the cell type in relationship to its neighbors, uh, to, its, to its sibling types. And you can also choose to highlight um, the expression of individual genes in all the cell types in the taxonomy shown here. Moving on to spatial transcriptomics, we thought it was really important to highlight um, not only uh, which genes are expressed in individual cell types, but where those cell types are located. So this is an example uh, slice of primary motor cortex showing where, um, in this case, L5ET uh, cells are likely to be located. And here is sort of an average uh, representation of the cortical depth of those L5ET sub, uh, cell types. We draw on the rich patch seq data set that was collected as part of the BICCN to display information about morphology. Um, so here is an aggregate of the average cortical depth of reconstructed axons and dendrites, um, here again for L5ET, uh, as well as an example reconstruction of a, of a single cell. Drawing on the same patch seq data set, we can display information about electrophysiology. So here are some key features that are summarized, such as action potential amplitude and input resistance, as well as um, some example action potential traces uh, here just, just plotted and displayed. And finally, we show um, the epigenetics data. So here in the form of um, attack seek, uh, in the form of a genome browser plot. And we also link out to the Brainome genome browser which is another BICCN affiliated tool where all of the RNA-seq, TAC-seq, and methylation data are hosted um, and easily browsable. Finally, I just wanna highlight uh, one last thing that really sort of is, is the engine underlying a lot of what cell type cards and cell types explorer can do, and that's this data-driven ontology. So an ontology is essentially just a structured controlled vocabulary um, that allows us to relate concepts about cell types and their relationships to each other um, in, an, in a sort of uh, machine readable way. So this is a, sort of a complicated plot, but essentially this is just highlighting the way in which the ontology pulls in um, descriptors of cell types, um, some sort of ontology specific cell terms, and then our own um, Allen Institute nomenclature for naming cells and um, sort of identifying taxonomy information. And this sort of allows the cell types explorer to, to have autocomplete search um, and easy navigation between cards based on either cell type terms, uh, names, or marker genes, and also really supports data provenance um, and versioning of taxonomies so we can continue to uh, refine cell types explorer into the future. So now I'll turn it over to Ambika for a cell types explorer demo and information about development. Thank you, Ray. Um, now I am going to be walking through the development process and then give a cell type explorer demo for the application. So uh, on the left hand side over here, we're looking at the cell type explorer web application. This application has been developed by the application team in the data and tech group at the Allen Institute of Brain Sciences. Currently, this is integrated in the brain knowledge platform itself. Uh, and this tool has been built using modern web technologies, which are React and Redux, GraphQL and D3. The application uh, will be accessible on the URL that you see down over here. Moving ahead, um, let's go into the development process. Uh, we have a four step process over here that I'll be going into one at a time. Uh, we start with so we started with a high fidelity uh, wireframing on Figma. Figma is basically a UX design tool uh, where we bring together what the application should look like for a particular user. Uh, what I mean by high fidelity is the granularity to which we are describing on uh, this particular tool what the application should look like. Now, this was a rapid prototyping effort as a result of which there have been multiple minor and major iterations that the application has gone through as we've gotten feedback from uh, user testing. So as you can see over here, the first version was 
more of the dendrogram layout of the taxonomy with a different way the cell type uh, card was displayed, which then eventually evolved to the sunburst visualization that Ray had talked about earlier as well, how that becomes better for a web interface. And uh, we improvised on the cell type card display as well. And then finally, through the iterations, we came to the uh, third version, which you will be seeing in the alpha release pretty soon. Um, so again, talking a little bit, going into the second and third step, we're talking about the rapid prototype development and the user testing. Um, once we did have the Figma or UX wireframes in place, we went ahead with a quick rapid iterative process to develop interactive prototypes on the web. Um, the two important things that we wanted to highlight over here, how were we getting the data and the image on these interact on this interactive web applications. We were using um, CSV and JSON files that regenerated for us to create an underlying data structure for in every cell type card. And the sunburst visualization that you've seen earlier was created using a web-based data visualization library called D3 and SVG objects. Also, all the images rendered on the cell type cards are PNG and SVG images, which are so, uh, stored on the source code directory itself. Uh, once we did have these uh, prototypes in place, we conducted user interviews and uh, refined the application based on the feedback that we received. Once uh, we did have the prototype in place, we got all the feedback, uh, we went ahead and started a development work and created the first alpha version of the Cell Types Explorer, which will be released in the Q4 2021 and is going to be accessible on this web page over here. Now uh, we're going towards the demo. I'll just walk through what the web app looks like and what different parts over there and highlight the different um, different pieces of information rendered over here that Ray had talked about earlier. So this is the first landing page that we come on to. On the left hand side over here, we have the taxonomy info panel where there's a brief description of the taxonomy. We have some information about the number of classes, subclasses and cell types on the taxonomy and then the data sets which were referenced to build out this taxonomy. Then uh, we have the autocomplete search functionality over here, which we talked about earlier. And this has been powered by the European Bioinformatics Institute's Solar Service. You can type, start typing in the cell type you're looking at, get all the results, click on one of the results that will navigate you to the cell type card. There's the interactive sunburst over here, which on using which you can explore the cell type hierarchy and by clicking on any of the nodes over here you can further navigate to the cell type card to explore it further there's also a link out to the hub map azimuth uh, to map your data to the mouse primary motor cortex over here you can go ahead on this tool map your data and then look at the cell plots and feature plots now, once you do navigate to the cell type card, this is what it looks like. We have a sidebar over here where you can see the type and accession info about the cell type card, the neighborhood map, which is essentially showing you the siblings and parents for the current node that you are on. You can click on the neighborhood map here itself and navigate to another cell type card that is of interest to you. The aliases, anatomy, and subject are listed here as well. Uh, then we come to the sections where you have the summary and references on the top. Uh, then you have the card dependent sections over here, which is transcriptomics, morphology, electrophysiology, spatial localization, and epigenetics, which we had mentioned and talked about earlier as well. Now, within each panel, uh, you have the functionality over here to make a selection of the data set that you want to look at or you have the functionality of looking at various source data links. So you can download the data, explore the data, or navigate to the project summary page for this particular data. There's also a panel option selection over here where for, uh, where for specific panels, for example, cluster matrix over here, you can look at the genes detected or the UMI count. Uh, that's all for the demo. I'll now hand it over to Lydia to display or talk about uh, what's coming up next. 
Thank you, Ambika. I'm going to talk about what's coming next for the Cell Type Explorer. And you heard from Ray and Ambika, the uh, alpha release of the Cell Type Explorer is focused on the mouse uh, cortex, uh, the mouse motor cortex. In future releases, we'll incorporate taxonomies for human and non-human primates using the same application infrastructure, as well as extending the application to enable comparisons between the cell types of the species. Further, as we speak, the BICCN is about to complete a whole brain, whole mouse brain sensors uh, of, the, of, of the cells in the mouse brain, perhaps generating 40 times the number of cell types we've just seen in the mouse motor cortex. We will need to develop out visualization workflows that allow some a multi-scale zoom and pan capability to visualize the cell type organization. Uh, we will be um, using uh, visualizations such as the constellation map that you see here, where individual dots represent a cell type and the shaded area a, a local neighborhood. And then we'll also leverage uh, TISNI and UMAP and other uh, dimensional reduction techniques to provide high resolution view of the cell type organization. These maps uh, together can additionally anchor uh, visualization and navigations now. Uh, this will help us uh, observe and explore uh, not only cell types, but the variations and gradients within a uh, cell type and across related cell type classes. A project is currently underway to actually generate whole brain spatial transcriptomic data, the MERFISH data that you saw before. Uh, this is a key enabling data set that will allow us to, to map cell types, both in the context of its sort of local cellular uh, architecture so that you can have a zoom in view of the microarchitecture of that piece of tissue in how cell types are related here. And also at a, at a meso scale view, we'll be able to get brain wide distributions uh, of cell types. This will enable us to link to uh, morphological and connectivity data that you saw at the beginning when Jeremy uh, des described the BICCN um, data set. Technologies such as these uh, uh, and additional technologies are becoming available. And as we generate more data by the neuroscience community and initiatives, we're going to understand cell types in even greater detail and perhaps find some flaws in our existing interpretation. As such, when we develop out the Cell Type Explorer, uh, we need to make sure the application and the infrastructure is able to readily incorporate new data and analysis. Uh, have the ability to be compared between different analysis as well to link to previous versions. Uh, with that, I am going to wrap up. Uh, first, I would like to thank everybody at the Allen Institute and also in the BICCN consortium, because it does take a village to create these uh, valuable data set and the resources that go with them. Uh, we'd like to thank our Allen Institute founder, Paul G. Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. And we also like to thank the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, who have provided various grants to support these projects. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to the uh, Cell Type Cards team. Um, I'm really looking forward to this tool. I think it's going to be super interesting. Um, and a question that we've got is, once more data is generated, how difficult is it to update the Explorer? Um, and I might add to that, I think sort of a two thing, like not only just putting more data in, but also, you know, I think cell type ide identification and characterization is still evolving. Like how, how do we amend or evolve this tool to include new types of data that might, might change how we think about cell types? Definitely, I think I can start answering that, Stephanie. Um, so the current web application is quite a lot data dependent and data generated. So anything that is updated on the data and will um, re-render the sunburst that we saw and also all the cell type cards are very data derived. So it'll be very uh, seamless to be integrating any new data that will be generated and be integrated in the web application.
Thanks, Amica. Lydia or Jeremy, do you have thoughts on how new types of data? I don't, and if you have ideas about any, what those modalities might be coming on the horizon could get incorporated into this tool? I think one thing that we built on is that every cell cluster and type that you saw in Cell Explorer had an identifier that said it came from a certain data set and this was certain certain analysis and this is its output. And so making sure we keep track of those identities such that when new data comes through and new analysis comes through, that they can all coincide without getting in each other's way is one key part. Right. And we are also, um, so folks from outside of the Institute can use this tool to put their data in to map their cell types, but do we also, we're pulling data from multiple sources and incorporating these data from, from other laboratories and research consortiums, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Cool. Um, I think we'll leave any further questions that come through uh, to you guys to answer um, in type. And uh, thank you for that great talk. Um, hopefully we'll see that tool come online um, very soon and we can all start playing with it. And um, we'll take our first break here and we'll be back at uh, 11.05 Pacific time to continue on with the first day of showcase. Thanks everybody.
All right, it is 11.05. I hope everyone had a good lunch and a good stretch break. Uh, I'm Lauren Alfiler, I'm the research associate here at the Institute, and I will be your moderator for the second half. So with that, let's kick it off. So our next NGL is Arif Hamid. Arif is a new assistant professor at uh, neuroscience at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Today, he will discuss how his work challenges his long-standing hypothesis about the global dopamine prediction errors. As I identified regions that specialize in forebrain dopamine dynamics that reflect local, computation, and quantitative decision-making and error encoding. And with that, I will turn it over to him. Uh, welcome, Arif. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren, for the kind introduction. And also, uh, I'm excited to be selected as part of the 2021 uh, NGL cohort. I'm excited to uh, engage in very exciting discussions with the Allen uh, community also. So my interests are really in trying to understand how the brain orchestrates adaptive and flexible behaviors in the context of reinforcement learning and decision-making, and really try to understand this cortical basic ganglia uh, thalamic uh, circuit together with dopaminergic modulation. There is a really extensive uh, literature that suggests that the overall uh, function of this circuit is to uh, plan and arbitrate among candidate options to really be able to decide what is worth uh, doing and to further uh, energize uh, the or release uh, these uh, candidate actions. We also know uh, that it does this uh, really based on what has worked before and the consensus is really this is a brain locus for um, reinforcement learning in the brain. So a longstanding uh, research goal uh, of mine has been to provide a very specific and quantitative uh, description of what decision signals are being relayed by the neurotransmitter dopamine as it, as it modulates this underlying circuitry under normative kind of uh, theoretical frameworks. Uh, and to look under the hood and identify biological and circuit substrates that end up uh, supporting some of these very specific computational operations. Really uh, to be able to understand how different behavioral demands end up leveraging some of these circuit and computational specializations uh, to af afford adaptive and flexible behaviors. Now, anatomically, dopamine cells tend to live here within the midbrain, and there's relatively very small amounts of them uh, in the brain, but they make these really impressive uh, and dense forward projections to the forward part of the brain, most notably arborizing in the striatal uh, and cortical subregions. You can appreciate the extent of this uh, density of projection. If you look at uh, studies that did single cell reconstruction of dopamine cells here, uh, this one cell occupying very large territories of the striatum here, and also uh, others, uh, that uh, meander uh, throughout the striatum. Now, functionally, uh, a full accounting of what dopamine actually uh, does is uh, not uh, present yet, but uh, we do have foundational knowledge across multiple levels of analysis that I thought I'll just summarize in, in one minute before I go on to motivate some of uh, the studies I'll tell you guys about today. So we know that this uh, overlying, underlying cortical basic ganglia uh, circuitry is thought to really take in proposals of what to do from the cortex and pass them through these uh, divergent and opponent um, direct and indirect pathways through the striatum that somehow maintain uh, some costs and some benefits of these uh, proposed action uh, plants and to really uh, control output here uh, of the basic ganglia to either accept or reject uh, these proposals through thalamic relay. And we know that dopaminergic input influences this circuitry through the D1, D2 receptors, both on short and longer timescales. So on the shorter timescales, there's a lot of evidence that dopamine, uh, transient changes in dopamine, bidirectionally changes the excitability of responsibility to glutamergic input of these D1 and D2 medium spiny cells in the striatum. We also know that on a much longer timescale, uh, dopamine induces uh, increases and in dopamine induces uh, plasticity at this cortical striatal uh, synapse of the D1 uh, through D1 receptors and opponently uh, regulates a depression of this cortical striatal synapse. If at the circuit level you think of uh, this uh, uh, circuit as uh, analogous to an OR gate, uh, you can also think of uh, transient elevations of dopamine through these excitability effects will really cause this gate to be transiently more porous, that is to accept uh, these uh, cortical proposals. Whereas uh, these uh, plasticity functions is really thought to change the synaptic set point of the circuitry so that future proposals will be much more likely to be gated through as this cortical D1 synapse is potentiated. 
Now, while translating uh, these cellular functions into behavioral functions has been a little bit of a challenge in the literature, there is some convergent evidence that suggests that online changes in dopamine, like those produced by psychoactive drugs like cocaine and others, are associated with changes in the uh, motivational vigor or uh, level of uh, energized uh, decisions that uh, humans and other animals make, suggesting that dopamine is is, uh, really affecting ongoing behavioral goals. Now, uh, these findings have been integrated into theories that suggest that dopamine is really critical for performance. Uh, uh, There's a variety of them, those suggesting that dopamine is amplifying the desire, motivational desire to pursue goals, or those that sway ongoing uh, vigor or or risks of uh, decisions. There's also a power literature that suggests that there are changes in the activity of the dopaminergic system that really affect future behaviors during moments of uh, uh, learning in, in, in in the world. Some of these studies, as you may know, are the seminal studies by Wolfram Schultz and others uh, that showed dopamine in codes, these reward prediction error terms that are used to iteratively adjust value or action, um, uh, state or action value uh, uh, expectations are from the world. And so while I've summarized across these two columns are the simultaneous and dual roles of dopamine in modulating ongoing uh, behaviors by helping the circuitry express learned values, and simultaneously also allowing the circuitry to learn new values so that future behaviors uh, can be affected. Reconciling some of these lear- simultaneous learning versus performance aspect of dopamine has been a really uh, a long-standing challenge in dopamine and continues to be so. And so uh, quite a, 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 few, a, a few years ago, uh, during my graduate studies, uh, we took a crack at helping to resolve uh, this theoretical rift by suggesting that dopamine, at least in the nucleus accumbens core, the ventral striatum, is able to multiplex both motivational and learning signals. And we suggested that you could do, accomplish this by uh, relaying a reward expectation or value signal. So some of these uh, value signals can be thought of as a really temporal discounts of future anticipated rewards. Uh, these uh, expected rewards can scale accordingly if rewards are less probable or delayed in time and so forth. And importantly, these discounted future rewards can actually be very useful motivational decision signals if you have to work to pursue these distant rewards. Moreover, uh, a dynamically and continuously changing a reward expectation signal can be corrected uh, by uh, environmental cues. Like here, a reward cue will correct an initial pessimistic expectation to a very large extent than an initial optimistic expectation. And because rapid deviations in value are reward prediction error signals, uh, we know that these rapid deflections can indeed encode reward prediction errors that can drive learning. And so the conceptual advance here is to suggest that a dynamically changing value or expectation signal can encode both motivational and also learning signals. But the trick here is really you have to rely uh, on some uh, mechanism that can toggle um, uh, plasticity uh, within the circuitry. And we think that outside of these windows, uh, dopamine will exert largely excitability effects. Um, And then perhaps a system like the cholinergic system that tends to pause at reward outcome, uh, maybe uh, those that are critical for inducing plasticity within the circuitry. So indeed, uh, supporting this view, we uh, provided some empirical evidence uh, that showed that dopamine uh, varying at multiple uh, uh, timescales Uh, encoded these value or expectation signals, and that across a variety of reward rates, uh, pretrial levels uh, were uh, correlated with the motivational vigor of the animal, and that rapid deflections at reward outcome were encoding reward uh, prediction errors. And using causal uh, uh, optogenetic methods, we also demonstrated that dopamine can regulate online motivational engagement and also drive learning uh, by changing the probability of future uh, decisions. And so these findings suggested that at least within the nucleus accumbens core that cares about the overall motivational engagement and return from the environment, that dopamine there uh, relays some kind of a signal about how valuable uh, work is at any given moment. And we thought this might be a really uh, neat coding strategy that could help um, uh, shape both ongoing and future behaviors. In a follow-up uh, with a postdoc in the lab, we also uh, did uh, spike recordings within the midbrain. And to our surprise, we found that 
Midbrain spiking is much more uh, faithful to reward prediction error signals, and this suggested that there might be some uh, disjoint coding of decision signals on the midbrain forebrain uh, axis of the dopamine system. Now, these findings do continue uh, to be a little bit contentious in the field, and, and uh, there are uh, various follow-ups to this work. Um, but at the time, we thought this might be, you know, an interesting circuit strategy that perhaps could allow these dopamine recipient targets of regions to tailor dopamine according to their own computational uh, and functional needs. Now, uh, some of you uh, might think that this is not too outrageous. We know that the dopamine recipient striatal subregions are quite heterogeneous, uh, both uh, you can distinguish them anatomically based on the complement of uh, thalamic and cortical glutamergic inputs they get, and also the various uh, molecular phenotypes uh, that they express. But we also know that they're organized into these uh, functional parallel uh, circuits that are themselves organized into these hierarchical spirals that tend to uh, uh, plan actions over multiple timescales of plants. Now, in the context of these functional heterogeneity of the underlying circuitry, it becomes quite a challenge for how dopamine could uh, be relaying uh, decision signals that can be useful for these uh, underlying subregions. So uh, we have this kind of uh, dogmatic framework within the dopamine literature that uh, built really largely on synchronous activation of dopaminergic spiking that encode reward prediction errors. And together with the kind of the anatomical finding of these divergent projection patterns, the dopamine must be relaying these reward prediction errors as an ascending uh, 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 global uh, broadcast signal. We also know that uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, signal uh, may itself not be computationally advantageous because if you have, uh, I hope you can see my mouse here, if you have uh, striatal subregions or channels that themselves were engaged in selecting um, action plants to different extents here indicated by the size of these circles, blasting everybody with a unitary signal is really quite disadvantageous. So what uh, has been suggested in the field is really to vector weight or revalue these uh, dopaminergic inputs to these underlying subregions. And uh, there's some plausible anatomy and, and some uh, modeling uh, evidence for this, but an empirical demonstration of this has been a gap in the literature. And I hope to show you today that actually the specialization or vectorization will be in, in the spatiotemporal um, domain here at the target subregion itself. And so one revision of uh, this uh, framework would be that, you know, there are some specialized dopamine signals arriving within the striatum itself that end up tailoring dopamine to the uh, underlying subregions own computational requirements. And a key uh, challenge to advancing such a view is that you need to, you know, identify um, organizational, fundamental organizational rules of how these dopamine axons are themselves being recruited while still providing some circuit general computational descriptions of what this, those signals are encoding. And in a recent uh, paper, we suggested uh, that this empirical observation of uh, wave-like dopamine activation patterns across the striatum may be uh, such an organizational rule, and that they themselves may be encoding spatiotemporally uh, vectorization of uh, these prediction error signals that are used for uh, plasticity learning functions and uh, signals for value of, uh, of how much the underlying subregion uh, provides uh, these uh, uh, predictions that can be used for ongoing goals. So I'll uh, provide a, a really brief synopsis of, of this work. So to do this, uh, we, we set out to image the large scale organization of dopamine axons in the striatum. Uh, and to do this, we injected large boluses of GCAMP into the midbrain in dad Cree uh, mice. And we also had an alternate uh, method where we injected these uh, fluorescent indicators of dopamine uh, delight directly into the striatum. We then aspirate off the overlying cortex to get optical access to this dorsal striatum subregion and insert an optical cannula that itself reveals about 60 to 80 percent of the dorsal surface of the dorsal striatum. And this is uh, kind of what this view looks like. For reference, this is the lateral ventricle. And so we put these animals on head fixed preparations for one and two photon uh, 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 imaging preparations. And really the initial uh, surprising finding that we found is that really across really, really large territories of the striatum, we found these spatially uh, continuous, uh, spontaneous activity patterns in the dopamine axons themselves um, that were uh, organized into these wave-like activation patterns. 
Indeed, these were also observed in uh, the dynamics of dopamine concentration across the striatum. And to date, we don't really find any uh, obvious difference between uh, these two uh, modalities of measurement. Now, what's really interesting, we thought, uh, we found was that uh, these waves end up coordinating dopamine input to functionally related striatal subregions. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, time series correlation of dopamine um, input to different parts of the striatum, uh, there appears to be some kind of uh, coordination. And that there is a, a distance dependent in this uh, co correlation pattern where uh, nearby striatal subregions get highly correlated dopamine input and there's this monotonic fall off that itself is dependent on medial lateral distances and not necessarily on anterior posterior distances. So we leverage some standard hierarchical clustering methods to identify striatal subregions that end up receiving related uh, dopamine inputs. And we find that at the highest cluster threshold, we always identify this these uh, uh, spatially contiguous territories of dorsomedial and dorsolateral striatal subregions. And if you progressively uh, reduce these crystal, uh, cluster limits, we find these smaller territories. We think these are actually very interesting subregions because they map onto what we functionally uh, have known for a long time uh, to be kind of functionally uh, different striatal subregions that have also been identified in the human uh, and, and non human primate uh, brains also. These uh, kind of center surround organization patterns are also observed in the micron scale and axon lattices in the striatum. And these also uh, we thought were interesting because uh, the activity of medium spiny cells have been reported across several labs to be organized into these center surround organization patterns that suggest they might be um, involved in forming uh, some ensembles that have uh, some, although uh, not full, uh, spatial relationships. And so together, these results really suggested that related uh, striatal subregions end up getting correlated dopaminergic inputs. And so we next asked whether or not functionally or behaviorally uh, relevant dopaminergic inputs uh, are themselves tailored to the computational specialty of these uh, subregions. So to do this, uh, we studied this in the context of the known specialty of the dorsal medium striatum's uh, role in agency learning. Uh, that is, that as animals pursue temporally extended goals, that the, itself requires some actions to pursue these distant rewards. We know that the dorsal medium striatum is enriched with neural representations for whether or not actions are indeed responsible for attaining rewards, that is uh, inferring agency. And there's a lot of evidence that if you inactivate this region or you, you block dopamine in these uh, areas, you produce a focal deficiency in learning. Uh, these animals uh, are really not able to understand that their actions control rewards. And so the explicit hypothesis kind of broad hypothesis we tested in this context is that if indeed dopamine is tailored to this underlying subregion's functional specialty, then dopamine arriving at the dorsal medium striatum should be sensitive to a amount, uh, extent of evidence for agency. And it will also guide this animal to perform um, instrumental behaviors uh, in these uh, tasks. So we designed a, a very simple mouse friendly uh, behavioral task that was meant to manipulate the amount of uh, reward controllability the animal had. And so these an head fixed animals uh, received audiovisual uh, feedback that mimicked them being under uh, this corridor. And importantly, there's two versions of this task, one in which animal walking on this corridor displaces them through this world. And another where just mere passage of time would displace them across the world and their actions uh, do not yield rewards. And this is effectively what it looks like an animal walking through the corridor, it pauses, progress in the corridor also pauses, and then at the very end, they'll get a reward. And in the uh, non-contingent version, animals uh, will propel, get propelled through this world and, and their actions do not control the world. And here I'll just uh, focus on what happens at a reward outcome when animals get a, a reward. What we find is that these uh, rewards elicit directional dopamine waves here at in the instrumental version of the task, you get a wave that initiates here in the more medial portions of the striatum propagating out laterally. And this tends to produce an early increase in dopamine here in the dorsal medial striatal subregions. You can see that this is quite uh, repeatable across a trials within a session. Um, whereas in the Pavlovian condition, you get these waves that initiates out here more laterally and propagate towards the more medial direction. And these produce a delay in dopamine arriving to these more medial portions of the dorsal striatum. 
this is again uh, repeatable across trials. And so um, the fact that across these two trials, you have a delay in dopamine um, across these two task conditions uh, suggested that there, there might be a role in uh, adaptive learning here. There's some evidence from slice work that suggests that the specific timing of dopamine arriving uh, relative to the pre-postsynaptic activation will really regulate the amount of plasticity induced at the corticostriatal synapse. And so we reasoned that these opponent uh, dopamine wave trajectories may be indeed um, a version of tailoring uh, important plasticity signals uh, to these underlying subregions. Um, and in data that I'm not showing you, uh, these uh, wave trajectories are themselves sculpted by task training. And so we next asked whether or not these are indeed useful for the amount of learning that the animal has to do um, across uh, these, uh, these tasks. To do this, uh, we designed a uh, within session reversal uh, block design that uh, without uh, the animal being able to predict uh, the contingency changes across uh, blocks of trials. And these animals indeed do report behaviorally in the amount that they run, that they do are able to detect these uh, uh, block boundaries where they tended to run more in instrumental trials and not in these Pavlovian trials. And we did observe uh, that these uh, wave uh, uh, directions are opponent in nature. What was actually very interesting is that here, uh, for example, at block transitions, uh, these waves that were initially more in the medial uh, direction uh, immediately change direction across uh, block transitions. And here is a quantitative summary of this across uh, several animals, suggesting these uh, waves are indeed able to uh, dynamically change as a function of task demands. Moreover, uh, these uh, wave directions in last trials were also able to predict how much the animal is willing to run on future trials, suggesting that these uh, waves uh, some, uh, may have some predictive power over uh, the amount the animals have learned to run in future trials. And this is another way to look at the same data, uh, which is multiple past wave directions have the capacity to predict um, or at least regress uh, the variability in trial by trial velocity in future trials. Okay, so just to summarize what I've told you guys thus far, when animals are in these instrumental tasks, you get these rapid increases in dopamine arriving in the form of mediolateral uh, waves um, that are perhaps um, changing uh, the amount uh, that the dorsal medial striatum is uh, receiving a reinforcement. And that these waves are sensitive to the task contingency, the reward contingency that these animals are exposed to, perhaps delivering reward credit again away and towards uh, dorsal medial straddle subregions. And that these may, uh, uh, I've also shown you that these uh, predict and precede the uh, behavioral adaptations that these animals are performing. And so uh, together, these results are suggested to us that this might be uh, one mechanism by which uh, dopamine arriving uh, to different parts of the striatum may indeed be tailored to the computational need of these underlying striatal subregions, where these uh, reward prediction error waves at reward outcome are vectorizing the relative timing or delay of dopamine arriving at different parts of the striatum. Now, I'll just uh, end with the slide by saying that I largely focused on the dynamics at reward outcome, but there's also a much richer anticipatory or pursuit epoch dynamics that we think sets up or, or conditions the expression of dopamine waves at reward outcome. And so uh, here, if you look at what happens under Pavlovian conditions, you get these per persistent ramp down in dopamine activity patterns, and then uh, followed by a uh, dopamine wave that uh, 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 deliver a uh, delayed dopamine here to the more medial portions of the dorsal striatum. Whereas under instrumental conditions, these dorsal medial striatal subregions are receiving progressive ramp ups as the animal gets closer and closer to the reward, followed by a, a medial lateral wave that tends to deliver dopamine um, uh, to these more medial subregions faster. And we interpret these progressive ramp downs actually during the anticipatory epoch as dopamine through the excitability effects relaying some evidence about how accurate the predictions of this striatal subregions actually are. Um, but in the Pavlovian condition, the predictions of action outcome contingency that the dorsal medial stratum is making is proved to be progressively uh, incorrect, whereas the converse is true here in the more uh, medial stratal subregions. And that uh, reward at um, 
waves at outcome are thought to come in and deliver uh, reward credit really uh, in proportion to the extent uh, these stratal subregions were uh, accurate in their predictions. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, I emphasized uh, the initial studies that uh, showed that dopamine indeed uh, across different stratal subregions has this fundamental dual role that it can shape uh, ongoing um, uh, computations and also those that will happen in the future. And that across different stratal subregion, a global broadcast view of dopamine really does not account for the heterogeneous functions that it needs to accomplish. And uh, we suggested this revised view that uh, perhaps dopamine at different parts of the stratum is spatially and temporally specialized, uh, perhaps delivering tailored uh, 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 computational uh, uh, decision signals to different parts of the stratum. Now I showed that uh, these wave-like activation patterns help to coordinate dopamine at uh, different parts of the stratum, and that events in the world like rewards help to synchronize dopamine uh, uh, that tends to vectorize uh, the relative timing of this really important plasticity signal in the stratum. And using the dorsal stratum's role in agency learning as a case study, uh, we suggested that uh, dopamine may be important for a spatial temporal credit assignment. Okay, with that, I'd like to stop by acknowledging uh, my uh, collaborators and mentors, uh, especially uh, Michael Frank, Chris Moore, and also Josh Burke, and uh, members of the laboratories and my funding source, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Hannah Gray Fellowship. Thank you guys very much, and I will take questions. Thank you so much, Reef. Oh, spotlighted. Awesome. There we go. Awesome. Um, I will start with a couple of questions. I have, I'm going to just start with my own because I will do that bias. Um, sure. So I noticed for your instrumental and probably in the past, because I just think of learning behavior, how would you expect like learning other learning tasks, such like extinction tasks, would affect the dopamine input? Yeah, so this is a, a really important uh, uh, point you've made. Actually, I, I, I uh, forgot to say that there is now future going, um, future work that is uh, in the pipes. Uh, planned uh, to really look at, you know, what are the mechanisms that help to coordinate and sustain these wave-like dopamine activation patterns, but also uh, the question that you asked, which is, what if the animal is engaged in learning a variety of different behavioral tasks, those that may not necessarily involve uh, learning about agency? Um, and right now, I don't necessarily know. Uh, um, I can say that in an aversive task where animals are experiencing eye puffs, for example, uh, we do get waves that are direct initiated from the posterior parts of the stride and propagating more anteriorly. And so this suggests there might be uh, a variety of spatial temporal profiles of activation that may complement uh, the specific functional need of the underlying circuitry. That's right. Yeah, I always hate when people ask, like, I showed you all this data, but you want me also to show more data? So I'm trying to frame it, what do you expect? I think that is a great point. Another question we have is um, fantastic work and talk. Uh, work and talk. What causes wave of dopamine release, and what mechanism might cause them to travel in different directions? And then maybe I'll tack on. I noticed you had it just for why you would expect a speedial lateral, but not anterior posterior. Yeah, yeah. So, so this these are really fun, like really important questions, and and they are indeed uh, the next uh, set directions to go. So um, it depends. Uh, so there are a couple of competing hypotheses that uh, we th we're, we've come up with that we think we're going to test. Is that you know if you like the excitation release framework that we have in neuroscience since for whenever that if you have patterns of activation um, of these dopamine axons in the stratum, then perhaps there may be inherited from sequential. Uh, uh, firing of midbrain dopamine cells. You combine that with some projection topography, then you can come up. Uh, you can get waves that are inherited from the midbrain. Right? We don't know if this is true. We're hoping that we can go after some high density recordings within uh, the midbrain to test this hypothesis. The second possibility is that uh, there are actually uh, mechanisms that have been identified, mostly in the brain slice, uh, that show that dopamine axons can be recruited and release dopamine independent of spiking from the midbrain. So there's local regulation of these dopamine axons through, you know, GABAergic mechanisms, cholinergic mechanisms, and perhaps other mechanisms. And these uh, regulators of dopamine themselves, like uh, striatal acetylcholine, have been demonstrated to exhibit some spatiotemporally complex patterns that one could uh, stretch to call uh, wave-like patterns. And so uh, it would be really interesting to know the extent to which these Midbrain initiated activation patterns regulate dopaminergic uh, uh, activity patterns in the axons, but also how the local circuitry could itself shape 
the dopamine release arriving locally uh, to the extent that they need it uh, to be. Um, and how these uh, could compete and collaborate across different behavioral epochs remains to be a kind of a direction that we'll pursue in the future. Well, we look forward to seeing the future of that and what direction it affects. Uh, question from Forrest. Thanks for the talk, super interesting. I'm relatively naive about dopamergic circuits, but does the spatial temporal differences then imply that there's a distinct VTA neurons are being activated in these two conditions and that these groups project differently into striatum? Are there other explanations that explain the underlying cellular basis for these effects? Yeah, so this is slightly related to the point I just made. So there is some evidence that uh, there is projection topography on the kind of medial VTA to lateral SNC of the midbrain dopamine cells and which territories of the striatum they occupy, especially on the medial lateral um, axis of the striatum. But the extent to which these different cells in their spiking are recruited in some sequence that explains the sequence of uh, dopamine waves in the striatum, um, I am not sure. Um, uh, so I guess, again, this is another really uh, good question. I just right now don't know. I think those are the best because it shows that there's more to get learned. <laughs> awesome. I was that, I don't think you have any more questions. So again, thank you, Arif. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat and Arif will get to them and answer them. Um, and with that, let's move on to our next part. So next is Showcase's first ever research associate led team talk. Research associates, also known as RAs here, conduct bulk of the data production here at the Institute. Today's talk will give an insight about what is done to generate data for our cell types pipeline. We will follow a single human cell from the hospital all the way to the final data. This data is used like in the cell type explorer talk we just saw a couple hours um, today. And with that, I will turn it over to our RAs. Hello, everyone. My name is Rusty Mann, and today I and my colleagues will be talking about the human patch seek MET pipeline and how research associates here at the Allen Institute collect data from a human neuron as it progresses through the patch seek MET pipeline. So today we'll follow a single human neuron from our recent human patch seek paper as it moves through the MET pipeline, starting with tissue processing and then proceeding through electrophysiology, transcriptomics, imaging, and then finally morphology. So I'll now hand off to Jessica to start us off with tissue processing. Thank you, Rusty. My name is Jessica Glow. I'm a research, research associate on the tissue processing team, and I'll be discussing where our human tissue comes from and how we prepare it for downstream experimentation. Here at Ellen, we have amazing opportunities to receive live human brain tissue that allows us to perform experiments important to the characterization of cell types. We receive our tissue from people in Seattle who undergo brain surgery for either epilepsy or tumors. Typically, with a temporal lobectomy for epilepsy or surgical resection for tumors, some healthy, normal tissue is removed as well as the pathologic site and all is discarded as medical waste. We're very interested in that healthy tissue. So with the patient's consent, we coordinate with the hospital to be able to pick up this tissue and use it in our experiments. We load up our cart with a cooler, cold pack, and specially formulated artificial that is kept oxygenated during transport. This ACSF contains a sodium replacement. So along with being cold, this decreases cell metabolism during transport and slicing. Keeping our tissue cold and in this oxygenated ACSF is essential for maintaining cell health and increasing viability. Our facilities team drives us in our cart to either Harborview, Utah Medical Center, or Swedish Hospital. We wait outside of the OR while the research coordinators we work with at the hospital get the sample and bring it out to us in the ACSF that we provide. As soon as we receive the tissue, we add our oxygenator that's fed by small portable compressed gas cylinders on our cart. We load back into our van and return to the Institute. This takes an average of only 22 minutes across all three hospitals. 2021 has been a slower year for us with 28 cases so far, but we typically go through this process around 50 times a year. We return from the hospital with tissue that looks like this. Patient data is anonymized, but the hospital does give us information about the patient's age, sex, medical history, and where in the brain the surgery was. This specific tissue with our cell of interest is from the right orbital frontal cortex of an epileptic patient who was 19 years old at the time. Once we get the tissue back to the institute, we photo document it and determine the optimal sectioning plane. A full slice contains a complete cortical column from white matter to PIA. This is important in helping the electrophysiology team orient themselves as to what cortical layer they're recording from. The desired plane of these slices is perpendicular to peel surface so that apical dendrites and axons are captured in full and not truncated, 
improving ability for the morphology team to trace and characterize these cells later. Before receiving tissue for each case, we don't know what it will look like and each piece is different. So each time offers a unique challenge in finding the best orientation for slicing that will yield the greatest number of whole slices in the desired plane. Once we found our desired orientation, we'll often cut off a small bit of tissue to create a flat mounting surface, then mount onto a chuck with super glue, surround the brain with auger, and insert into a compressed tome. This is a type of vibratome that provides us with fast, consistently 350 micron thick slices. You can see here, we continue to oxygenate our tissue at all points that we can to maintain optimal cell health. The slices that come from the compressed tome end up looking like this. You can see the white matter on the upper left and the peel surface to the right. This slice will look familiar later in this talk as this is where our cell we're following came from. These slices are incubated for 10 minutes in a heated ACSF bath, which is used as the recovery step to return the cells back to physiologically normal conditions. Depending on experimental needs, these slices will either be cultured or continue on as cute slices. Culture slices are plated on membrane inserts in wells containing slice culture media and then stored in an incubator. We are able to directly apply viruses to label cells of interest and record from these slices anywhere from a few days after slicing to a few months down the line. Acute slices are placed into an oxygenated ACSF that contains sodium so cells can fire as normal. These slices are recorded from by the electrophysiology team that same day or the day after. Now I'll hand off to the next step in the MET pipeline, electrophysiology. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name is Sarah Vargas. I am a research associate in the electrophysiology team. And today I'm here to tell you about the electrophysiology data generation in our IVSCC MET pipeline. So in the IVSCC pipeline, our research associates use the patch con technique to collect high quality triple modality data morphology, electrophysiology, and transcriptomics, or commonly referred to as MET data for a single neuron. For this presentation, a human neuron has been chosen as an example to navigate through our IBSCC MET pipeline. A human neuron's journey through our pipeline begins at the EFIS rig. Once we receive a human brain slice prepared by our tissue processing team, we place the slice in the bath chamber of the rig. Then we navigate through the human brain slice in search of a healthy human neuron. Once a healthy neuron is found, we perform patch clamp electrophysiology experiments to collect and characterize the intrinsic electrophysiological properties of a single cell. To do this, we take a glass pipette and bring it close to the membrane of a cell body. Then mild suction is applied to form a tight seal between the glass pipette and the cell's membrane. And finally, a stronger pulse of suction is applied to rupture the cell's membrane, thus allowing physical access to the neuron to examine its electrophysiological features, while we simultaneously, passively, fill the neuron with a fluorescent dye. This technique is the basis for patch clamp electrophysiology and one component of the patch seat technique. So once we are in whole cell mode, Standardized stimulus sets developed by our EFIS team are delivered to the neuron. These stimulus sets are really designed to calculate key electrophysiological features from the cell's responses, which allows for the classification and clustering of cells based on their electrophysiological properties, as seen in this TSNI plot from Goins et al., where neurons are classified and clustered into excitatory or inhibitory E types. Whole cell patch clamp recordings are just the first component of the patch seek technique. But really, the unique feature of patch seek is that it allows for the transcriptomic identification of the same recorded neuron. At the conclusion of this whole cell recordings, as shown in A, we transition to collecting the mRNA of the neuron. This is achieved by the smallest amount of negative pressure to extract the cell's cytoplasmic contents and ultimately the nucleus. The negative pressure extracts the cytoplasmic contents and attracts the nucleus to the tip of the pipette, while we monitor the seal resistance of the cell as shown in the current trace in B. While monitoring the resistance of the seal, we begin to retract the pipette and the nucleus. 
This has to be done slowly and methodically until the cell membrane ultimately breaks, forming a tight seal around the nucleus and fusing back together to seal the somatic membrane. This stage is crucial to preserve the integrity of the somatic membrane and to retain the fill of the neuron for morphological reconstruction. Our team has discovered that the variables for successful nuclei extraction and the maintenance of the somatic membrane can vary across different brain regions, cell types, and even the health of the neuron. This means that this is very much an iterative process that continues to be refined by our team as we continue to collect data from multiple brain regions, cell types, and species. Once the nucleus is collected, the contents are quickly transferred to a lysis buffer, as shown in B. These are then sent out for transcriptomic analysis. So, going back to our human neuron example, with the patch seek technique, we obtain one, the electrophysiological features for this human cell, two, high quality mRNA via the extraction of the nucleus for transcriptomic characterization, and three, we fill the neuron with a dye for further morphological analysis. And so with this, the IBSC pipeline concludes the collection of high quality triple modality data. And now Rustaman will tell you about the process for transcriptomic data generation. Thanks, Sarah. So my name is Rusty Mann, and I'll now be talking about how transcriptomic data is generated by the RNA-seq team here at the Allen Institute, and how that allows us to identify the transcriptomic type of our human patch-seq neuron. So as Sarah mentioned earlier, at the end of the EFIS recording, the nucleus is extracted from the cell and deposited in a collection tube. So at the end of each day, these tubes are collected and then sent off to the RNA-seq team here at the Institute. Here we just see a rack of these sample tubes that have all been collected by the EFIS rig operators as they're being prepared to proceed through the RNA-seq part of the MET pipeline. So right now the RNA-seq team processes about six 96 ball plates per week between both fax and patch seq, uh, with one or two of those plates being from the patch seq teams. This puts us on pace for about 6,500 patch seq cells this year, which still leaves some additional capacity as we're still getting back up to our pre-pandemic production. So here we see the flow chart for the RNA-seq lab. And as you can see, it's quite involved with a lot of steps, but I'll summarize the relevant parts here in a moment. So this process was first established for fax and dissociated cells prior to establishing the patch-seq the patch process a few years later. And the whole thing takes about five weeks to get from when we initially collect uh, patch-seq data to the point where we have the RNA-seq data back. So the patch seq tubes enter the pipeline at the top of the diagram here, highlighted by the box. And the first step is amplification step, which reverse transcribes mRNA to amplified cDNA, which is then fragmented and barcoded in the library step, and then sent off to an outside vendor for sequencing. So we'll get that data back uh, for alignment and then mapping. Now I'll be focusing on the amplification and mapping steps, as those are the relevant steps that are performed by RAs here at the Institute. So starting with amplification, uh, we'll visualize the cDNA via electropharogram traces from the fragment analyzer as a quality check. Each amplification sample is given a pass or fail score, where a passing sample will be a high molecular weight, averaging around 2,500 base pairs uh, cDNA, with the majority of that product greater than 400 base pairs, as indicated by the dashed line here. Uh, failures can be either due to no product, uh, indicated by the flat line, um, where there's just no product detected, or they can be due to degraded product, where there's only a small sample of lower molecular weight cDNA that is found, and most of that, which is below 400 base pairs. So in addition to the fragment analyzer traces, uh, we also utilize PFOGREEN as a quantity check. This is a dye that's mixed with and that binds to the cDNA, uh, and it can be excited and the fluorescence measured to get the total amount of cDNA present in the sample. So, uh, the spreadsheet diagram on the right here is of the pico green results from a 96 well plate of samples. So a control column serves as the fingerprint for the set, while all other cells here represent pico green concentrations within single sample tubes. Um, these pico green yields are then compared with the fragment analyzer data to ensure accuracy, as well as to identify any process problems that uh, occurred during amplification. Now, while the patch seek data are typically very good quality in general, uh, when that's compared to the fax data set, uh, these patch seek cells are more prone to contamination from other cells and just less clean overall, mostly just because of how uh, they're collected. 
So this is why instead of applying clustering techniques to the patch seek transcriptomes to find their cell types, as we do with the fax data set, we instead map the patch seek cells onto the fax data set. So for our purposes here, the fax data set is serving as a high quality reference taxonomy tree. So we'll use our human patch seek uh, neuron as an example here. So we start from the highest branch point of the reference taxonomy tree, and we compare the gene expression of our human patch seek neuron with that of the fax cells on both sides of the branch point. And then we move the cell to the next branch point on the side that has the higher correlation. This process continued uh, until we reach a leaf node on the uh, tree. So this is done 100 times per patch seek cell, which gives us the probability of mapping that patch seek cell to each uh, cell type. Now, higher quality patch seek transcriptomes usually end up landing on a specific cell type most of the time, while lower quality patch seek transcriptomes might end up on several different cell types. Now, our human patch seek cell here is mapped to the excitatory layer 2 LAMP5 LTK transcriptomic type 91% uh, of the time, uh, but it also maps to a couple of nearby neighboring types as well, but it's only a small percentage of the time for each. So you can say that our human patch seek neuron here has a pretty high quality transcriptome and maps pretty confidently. So I'll now hand off to Shay, uh, who's going to take us through the process of imaging the cells. Thanks, Rusty, for that introduction. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Shay Ransford and I'm a part of the scanning lab, so I'm going to be going through uh, the steps of imaging and preparing the uh, tissue sections for the morphology team. Okay, so after the tissue sections have been stained and mounted uh, in histology on standard one by three inch microscopy slides, they are then sent to the scanning lab for image acquisition. Uh, here I've shown a general outline of the imaging production pipeline, which includes slide check-in and run plan generation, uh, 20x full tissue scans, handing these 20x scans off to limbs, uh, doing QC on these images, and uh, waiting for 63x skull calls from morphology, performing 63x D stacks of desired cells, um, then handing these images off to limbs, and then doing a final quality control check on these images. So every week we receive a box of slides from histology containing usually anywhere between 20 and 100 tissue sections. Uh, when checking these slides into limbs, we like to make sure to verify the slide barcode, uh, the specimen ID, the complete run plan name, and the Z-step interval for any potential 63X scans that can be done. Uh, and for human tissue, this step size is 0.44 microns. Um, once checked in, we then acquire 20x single plane full tissue scans of every slide in the run plan. Scans are captured in DAPI, where we aim to view as many nuclei in focus as possible. And uh, they are also captured in Brightfield, where we try and capture as many filled cells on the tissue as possible. Um, the microscope software that we use allows for an offset between the two channels so we can capture optimal focus planes in each. Um, and then once we upload these images to limbs, we can verify that both channels are present uh, and then that morphology can do their 63x go calls. So here is uh, on the left, you can see an example of a 20 of a 20x scan in Brightfield of a full tissue section. And this is actually the tissue section that we've been following uh, in this entire pipeline. A single tissue section can have anywhere from one to 10 labeled cells and none or all of them can be called for 63x acquisition. Uh, on the right, we can see a, the zoomed in tissue section that we've been following, and even the particular neuron we've been following, which I've outlined and is labeled cell three. Um, once these go calls have been done, we then gather specific slides for uh, Z-Stack acquisition at 63X, where we aim to capture uh, snapshots of the axons and the dendrites in the XY plane. Uh, we then use these snapshots to create a tile region and then uh, after that, we verify the upper and lower bounds in Z uh, to make sure that we're just capturing every aspect of the cell. And we usually add a buffer zone of around 10 to 20 microns uh, above and below the last focus point in the cell just to make sure that everything is captured. 
Once we upload these images to LIMS, we then check that there were no issues during acquisition or even during processing. Some of the main things we look for are verifying that there was no cutoff in X, Y, or Z. For example, here's the top plane of an example cell where you can still see part of the axon in focus, and I've just highlighted that for you. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's no significant tessellation in the imaging or if there are any stitch errors uh, done either during acquisition or even during processing, because due to the nature of it being a tile region, we have to stitch all of the different uh, tiles together. Morphology may call cells for rescanning if any of these issues are present. Uh, however, assuming there are no issues during 63X acquisition or during processing, uh, I'll hand it off to Julia and the morphology team to continue the MET journey. Thank you, Shay. Hi, my name is Julia Andrade, and I'm a research associate in the morphology team of the neuroanatomy department. On this talk, I will be discussing the data we generate for the MET pipeline. We received 20X images from microscopy, which we used to inform whether a cell should receive a 63X image stack, which we refer to as go pulse. If the cell is a no-go for 63X, it is considered a fail. If it's a go, we wait to receive the 63X image and do a quality check, in which we assess the image quality and the morphological characteristics of the cell of interest. Here is a 63X image containing the human neuron we're following on this talk. This image did not have any issues, and we were able to do an initial classification of the cell regarding the presence of spines, apical dendrite truncation, axon extent, biocide and fill quality, and cell health. Cells may be failed after 63X images are generated for multiple reasons, the most common ones being biocide and fill and leakage, cell health, apical dendrite truncation, and tissue health. Certain issues require the image to be rescanned, the most common ones being image cutoff and stitching. After the 63X image passes the quality check, the cells get sorted based on project priority and the image stacks of for prioritized cells are converted to TerraFly format. We then use the va 3 d software to manually reconstruct a three-dimensional representation of the cell. Additionally, cells that pass 63X quality check can also be auto-traced with minimal manual edits. After the cells are reconstructed, we use a 20X image to draw cortical layers, PIA, and white matter on limbs. This allows us to orient the cell within the structure and layers. Then we use the common coordinate framework, CCF space, a multimodal 3D reference atlas to pin the cell within a specific location and orientation. These cells are then run through a morphologic analysis, which results in about 40 individual features for each cell. Then the cells can be released to the public. The Mosaic interface of va 3 d allows us to generate accurate three-dimensional digital representations of neural morphologies. We use large-scale image tags containing serial 2D images and use the software to visualize them in 3D. We then capture the positions of the soma, dendrites, and axon of cells on all three planes to accurately reconstruct the cell's morphology. Here's a finalized reconstruction of the human neuron we're following on this talk. In the reconstruction process, we place nodes in the 3D space to trace the signal in the images according to all three planes. We trace the cell signal starting at the stoma to the full extent and make sure all branches are connected to the main structure. Multiple colors are used to trace different cell components and also to identify feedback from tag teaming, a process in which a fellow reconstructor does a double check of the cell. After the reconstruction is finalized, we give it a standardized appearance by sorting and spacing out the nodes and assign radii to fully capture the thickness of each branch. Once manual reconstruction or auto trace is complete, we can generate several morphological features of each reconstruction. Here's the morphology summary for the human neuron we're following on this talk and its histogram, which is used to quantify and summarize the distribution of a cell's axon and dendrites across the three dimensions plotted relative to the cortical layers. Histograms allow us to compare multiple neurons at a summary level that captures the broad patterns of each cell structure. Our data analyst, Matt Mallory, has been working with Olga Glyco on the Autotrace project, in which neurons are automatically reconstructed with minimal manual intervention. 
Although AutoTrace still requires some minor manual edits, the model has the possibility to output 50 to 100 reconstructions per week. For a single cell, we can now define its morphological type based on features from its reconstruction, its electrophysiological type from characteristics of the cell's electrical behavior, and its transcriptomic type from sequencing its transcriptome. This data then moves on downstream to highly talented data scientists here at the Allen Institute that use high dimensional clustering techniques to combine these three independent modes of cell typing into a single MET cell type. We would like to thank Paul Allen, the Allen Institute founder, as well as everyone involved in the MET pipeline for making this work possible. Thank you. Great, thank you, RA. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so let's, yeah, and then we got Rusty to take it. So first question is, and it's kind of be for you or just anyone else on your team, if you know, are there any noticeable differences in technique when you're applying uh, for human versus mouse brains? Gotcha, yeah, so they're actually pretty similar. Um, there aren't a whole lot of differences. I mean, I think, you know, I have the most experience um, working with the EPIS team, so doing the recordings and stuff. Those, um, the human neurons can be a little more tricky. Um, I think we, you know, we require some, like some smaller pipette sizes, um, the amount of pressure and stuff that we use also, uh, in break-in as well as during the nucleus extraction can vary somewhat. Um, oftentimes I think the human cells can be a bit more, um, kind of fragile and just more tricky to break into, uh, as well as trying to get that nucleus. It can just be a bit more tricky. Um, as far as the other, uh, parts of the pipeline, I mean, it's all pretty similar, um, there's a few differences like with the, with the imaging, uh, just because I think these human neurons are usually larger. Um, uh, yeah, so, but other than that, I mean, they're actually quite, quite similar, so techniques. Awesome. Um, and then here's just another uh, patch-seq, RNA-seq data. The patch-seq cells are not clustered alone, but a map to fax data because the patch-seq data is noisier. Do I understand correctly that the fax data are from nuclei, which the patch-seq data are from SONA, could this be driving some of the differences between UC and experiments? How do you deal with that? So, yeah, well, the, the sorry, the patch seq data are from from nuclei. Uh, we're collecting the nuclei on the patch seq data, so that's yeah, should be the same. And then I think we have time for another question. Um, human tissue is known to have uh, loop oh, Does lipid that make it yeah, loop Does that make it any of the steps harder? It does. That's one of the things that makes it more difficult to, to patch the human neurons. Um, you know, so you ideally, you don't want to try and find cells that don't have excessive amounts of light You can still patch into them, but it makes it much more difficult to seal onto them. Um, and then, yeah. And, oh, and then I guess there's one more question um, for mapping. This one's for you. For mapping, what is the threshold for high quality versus low quality? For example, would 15% of another type be considered low or high quality? Yeah. Okay. So off the top of my head, I don't actually remember like the, what the exact percentage would be. Uh, and I can, you know, we can, I'll get that in the chat, but it's actually kind of more complicated than that. We don't just, you know, go straight off of, um, you know, the percentage of time that it maps to types. There are additional kind of QC metrics that will also, um, you know, cause a cell to be considered either high or low quality. Um, it, I didn't have time to go into a lot of that. Uh, it, Normalized marker sum scoring is, is another factor that we use here, which is looking at on and off marker genes and basically like that, like the ratio of those um, for the given patch seek cell, yeah, compared to the, the known patch uh, fact cell types. Awesome. Um, with that, there's not many other questions. So uh, if anyone else has questions, feel free to drop. All the panelists are um, here and they'll be able to answer questions throughout the day. And with that, we'll take it to our next NGL. Um, our next NGL is Yan Wong, and her, pres her presentation today is titled Boom and Bust Brains and Reverb Brains in Development of Developmental and Evolutionary Time, which is her research on a very unique model system, as we see here, octopuses and bees. Uh, she studies aging and death via the neurological mechanisms, evolutionary origins, and social dimensions. Today, she'll discuss the boom and bust cycles for these brains and these two animals, the neuroactivity control of the deaf and octopuses, and in the social and control in the adult bee behavior. 
She's also an incoming assistant professor of psychology and biology at University of Washington come fall 2022. So we want to welcome her to Seattle and also to Showcase. And with that, we'll take it away. Thank you so much, Lauren. Let me just test out this. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm calling in from Lenape Hoking, which is the unceded territories of the Lenni Lenape people, also called Princeton, um, whereas right now I'm a postdoc at Princeton University. And as the title of my talk um, implies, I use both evolutionary and developmental perspectives to study the brain. So I think that these two perspectives have a lot of potential to enrich our understanding about nervous system function and very importantly, decline. So as more of our population is getting older, I think it's important for neuroscientists to understand aging and decline processes from as many angles as possible, including um, from non-traditional sources of knowledge, such as these two um, invertebrates. So I've titled uh, my talk, Boom and Bust Brains, because um, one, I like the alliteration. Two, uh, both of these animals have really unique boom and bust uh, life cycles. And three, uh, boom and bust, or a period of, of rapid expansion and growth, followed by a period of rapid decline. This is a theme that I'm seeing more and more um, throughout the work and throughout the questions that I'm interested in. So for example, you know, what can we uh, learn from uh, moments of massive explosion and neural forms, such as at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, and then on a developmental time scale, um, so over the course of an individual's life, um, what causes rapid decline as we age? So um, today I'll actually spend most of my time in this developmental space, um, but I do want to take a little bit of time to highlight why these two invertebrate models in particular are so powerful for examining a whole range of uh, neurobiological questions. So on the, um, on the surface, it may seem like these animals don't have that much in common with us, but actually a growing body of research shows that many of the shared molecular mechanisms and principles that underpin nervous system organization and function are shared between invertebrates and vertebrates. So these two models have huge potential to inform our understanding. On the left here, we have the octopus, sometimes called the primates of the ocean. They have um, the most elaborate central nervous systems of any uh, invertebrate organism. They have over half a billion neurons split between their central brains and the axial nerve cords of their arms. Um, as an example of shared mechanisms, there we go. Um, some of my previous work identified an independent expansion of proto-coherens in the octopus nervous system. So previously um, expanded clustered proto-coherens had only been identified in vertebrates, where they're thought to be really important for circuit formation and other developmental processes. This expansion that, um, of clustered proto-cadherins proto that we found in octopuses is the first to be identified in invertebrates, and we see that um, these octopus genes even have shared or conserved exon to protein domain correspondence as the human proto -cadherins. So this is a really um, remarkable example of convergent evolution between humans and octopuses. Bumblebees, uh, like humans, are really uh, social animals and they live and they um, create and they age and they die in highly sophisticated uh, social groups. And in all animals that live socially, uh, there's a growing appreciation for the fact that um, aging processes and mortality are impacted by social factors such as um, your social status or your social connectedness. And so I won't really talk about this work today, but um, using new uh, sequencing techniques and machine learning multi-animal post uh, estimation, we can go from the level of a single gene and a single cell in the nervous system of one bee to quantifying um, large scale behaviors of an entire social network. Um, and so in this way, we can take advantage of the bumblebee social network to understand um, how different social factors impact divergent aging phenotypes. So overall, um, these two animals are really exciting to study in their own right and very powerful tools for comparative analysis. 
So um, today I'll spend most of my time with you talking about death in the octopus. This is the octopus I study, um, Octopus bimaculoides, or the California two-spot octopus, named after these blue spots, um, which are just under their eyes. This balloony structure right here is called the mantle, and that houses all of their guts and reproductive organs and their hearts. And then, of course, these are their, um, their eight arms lined with suckers. So I've mentioned that octopuses have very big brains. Um, but unlike vertebrates that have evolved to have large brains, um, so think of primates or corvids, octopuses are very short-lived. So these animals, these octos in particular, live for only about a year to a year and a half. And this is because a part of their nervous system promotes death after the octopus mates. Okay, so um, in other words, yeah, the octopus nervous system ensures that octopuses die after mating. And this is a very, very fast process. So let me put this in, in the context of um, the octopus's entire life cycle. If you're a baby octopus, you start life out as an egg. So, you know, here's, here's you and all of your siblings right next to you. These uh, tiny black dots, if you can see them, those are your developing retinas. These eggs will hatch pretty much all at once. Um, and as soon as these octopuses hatch, they can do a lot of things that an adult octopus can do. So for example, they can flash their colors um, using chromatophores. They can manipulate things with their arms. They can uh, swim and hunt. The first thing that you do though, is you disperse because if you don't, your siblings will eat you. Um, and in the early months of your life, your only job is to eat and eat and grow. So this is what I would call the boom phase of an octopus's life. Um, during this phase, young octopuses can incorporate up to 6% of their body mass per day. Then around uh, six to eight months of age, octopuses become sexually mature. And then they have to find a mate to reproduce. Um, mating really signals the beginning of the end. So for female octopuses, um, you fertilize your eggs, you find a safe spot to lay them. So this female has chosen this um, terracotta or clay pot right here. Here's all her eggs. Um, so, so the female deposits all of her eggs. And then what was previously known is that she then spends the next weeks and months um, devotedly taking care of her eggs. So, you know, um, gently brushing them to keep them with her suckers to keep them clean and blowing water on them to oxygenate them and, of course, to protect them from any predators. And they're so um, single minded in this endeavor that they don't eat, uh, nor do they leave this, uh, this den at all. And then by the time the eggs are ready to hatch, the female dies. So um, this is the bust phase because when this decline process begins, um, uh, dying and, and death proceeds extremely rapidly. So this, um, you know, live fast, die young lifestyle describes almost all of the octopus species that science knows about. Um, and octopuses aren't unique in mating only once and then dying. So for example, you know, salmon do that as well. But I was really interested in this because um, it is neuroendocrine signaling that controls these terminal stages of life. Um, and this uh, makes sense from what we know about um, invertebrates. So invertebrates, um, reproductive events and behaviors are controlled by the neuroendocrine system. So the hypothalamus is the vertebrate uh, neural control center for endocrine or uh, hormone signaling function. And then the pituitary gland serves as this um, intermediary between the central nervous system and the reproductive organs. So there are both um, stimulating and inhibiting hormones that work together to control um, really important life history events like sexual maturation, mm -hmm. ovulation, uh, lactation. Um, in the octopus, the optic glands, which I've highlighted in orange here, are the neuroendocrine center. And they are functionally analogous to the vertebrate anterior pituitary gland. 
So they mediate, they also mediate communication between the central brain and the rest of the body to control um, sexual maturation. Um, however, the mechanistic details of this, um, of this pathway are, are really not known, which I've tried to highlight with these question marks here. So for a long time, researchers suspected that hormone signaling was at play underlying the optic glands function, but we had no idea um, what those horm hormones are or how they were utilized um, and very little uh, understanding about optic gland function in general. Um, so this is a, a top-down view of the octopus central nervous system. Pardon my cat right here. I've highlighted the optic glands in orange right here. Um, they're these tiny little spheres. They're called the optic glands because they're closely associated with the optic lobes, which are these like bigger kidney-shaped things here. Um, and as far as we know, they don't have any function in visual processing. Um, however, there is one really um, pivotal study done in 1977 that showed that when you remove the optic glands from brooding females, so a female, like a brooding hen, a female octopus that's um, taking care of her eggs, this entire post-mating death process is reversed, or at least delayed. So after um, the removal surgery, as soon as the octopuses wake up, the female abandons her clutch. So this would never happen under uh, typical circumstances. She starts eating again. She will gain weight and even go on to reproduce for a second time. Ultimately, the animals that had their optic glands removed lived for almost six months longer than their intact counterparts, which is really significant when um, you only live for a year or a year and a half. And so uh, beyond this, we really didn't know that much about um, optic gland function or how these uh, potential neurohormones were being created or released or utilized. Um, and this is exactly what I wanted to study. Um, and these are the questions that you know, I was interested in when I started this work back in 2013. So what are these, uh, what, are, what are the behaviors? Can we study them in the lab? Um, what are the genes, signals, and pathways underlying these changes in maternal behaviors and death? And then of course, how does the organization of the nervous system support this? Um, but back in 2013, almost no progress had been made towards any of these questions um, since the mid 20th century, mostly due to the lack of available tools. So the octopus, of course, is a non-model organism and also one that is rather challenging to um, keep in the lab. And so a lot of the uh, very cool technological advances of the late 20th and the early 21st century kind of eclipsed the study of the octopus. Um, so uh, with a team of international and local collaborators, we sequenced the octopus genome in 2015. And this gave us um, access to the molecular code of these animals. This really opened the door for being able to um, answer the questions about aging and death that I was interested in, but of course also accelerated discovery in so many other avenues, including development and regeneration. Um, so today's work uh, um, it, uh, is only possible because of these amazing people, including uh, these four uh, students who were U Chicago undergrads at the time. So um, the first thing that I wanted to do was to be able to study maternal behaviors and adult octopus behaviors in the lab. So we brought in a bunch of octopuses from California, took a ton of video, observed the behaviors, and ultimately we classified adult behaviors into four stages, um, non-mated, so before they reproduce, and then three stages of maternity, feeding, fasting, and decline. So I'll show you some examples of these now. Um, in the non-mated stage, octopuses are very uh, curious and active predators. So this one here, you're seeing um, leaving the home den to pounce on this crab and drag it back. After they mate and lay eggs, though, um, this changes. So in the first phase of maternity, we observed that the female octopuses did eat. Um, but as you can see here, the, the kind of the, the mode of hunting has changed a lot. So this is a female octopus, her eggs are in this pot behind her, and she's just kind of reaching her arm out to grab that crab. Um, 
rather than kind of leaving, abandoning her eggs and, and pouncing actively on that crab. So this is a change in the, um, in the hunting behavior that I'm eager to, to follow up on. The next phase of uh, maternal care or maternity is called fasting. Um, and at this point, the octopuses stop eating and then they never eat again. Um, I'm not gonna show you a video because it's kind of boring to watch an octopus not eat something, um, but I wanna show you an extreme example of this maternal fasting. So these are stills from um, ROV deep sea dives in which this octopus mom here, this deep sea octopus mom, these uh, white like grape-like structures are her eggs right here. She was observed to fast for 53 months. So scientists kept returning re returning to her site and they never saw her eat, um, even though you know there's a big crab here, there's smaller crabs all around her. So of course this behavior that we see here, this fasting behavior is very different from the previous two that I just showed you. Our animals are not um, deep sea animals, so they don't, uh, they don't fast or live as long as this, this deep sea animal. But we did notice that if they fasted for four consecutive days in a row, they would never return to feeding again. The last phase um, was uh, a new phase of maternal care too, and it's called decline. Um, so, uh, this is a period of a very rapid and active whole body deterioration. Um, the animals lose color, they lose muscle tone, and very strikingly, they spend a lot of time away from their eggs, um, engaging in self-injurious or um, self-cannibalistic behaviors. So let me show you an example here. This female octopus is throwing herself against the edge of this aquarium and she's about to turn in a second and you'll see this white patch at the very tip of her mantle. This is where the top layers of skin um, have actually been abraded away from this behavior. Some animals do this against the edge of the tank, some um, kind of plummet to the the gravel on the tank to rub their mantles. Others will stay near their, their pot and rub their mantles against their pot. And this is the same female three days later. Uh, you can see that that, that uh, leisure lesion um, has grown a lot. Um, so all of this white areas where the skin has been rubbed away, her arms are curled around the edge of that injury and she's actually picking the skin away. Um, she's also a lot more lethargic, spending time near the water surface. Um, there's a lot of other uh, uh, symptoms or I guess uh, traits of this. Um, so this is the individual I just showed you in the middle. Um, in A, um, the mother, uh, what we're showing here is that the mother spends a lot of time outside of her den and her body posture becomes very uh, dysregulated. So her arms are not um, kind of in any type of posture that's very organized and kind of limply hanging there. And we suspect that this is due to deterioration of the vestibular system, um, but we don't know for sure yet. In C is an example of um, autophagy or self-eating um, or self-cannibalism. So um, if you count the arms here with me, we have one here, two going up the side of the container, three, four, Five, um, this mother has eaten the distal tip of this fifth arm. Six, um, this white spot here is where she started chewing the skin off of the sixth arm, and then seven and eight. Okay, so I'm just showing this to, to um, highlight the fact that there's multiple signatures of this decline phase um, in our species of octopuses. So um, in order to study the neuroendocrine mechanisms behind this, um, we did RNA sequencing for optic glands at females at each of these stages um, of, of adulthood and, and maternal uh, behaviors. We then looked for differentially expressed transcripts, um, so genes that have different levels of expression across the different behavioral conditions. And I group these by similarities and expression um, because we found so many differentially expressed genes. Um, and I'm going to highlight two of these groups here. 
So let me just um, orient you to the axis here. Along the x-axis, we have the different phases, um, non-mated, feeding, fasting, and decline. And on the y-axis, we have a normalized um, measure of expression. So the more highly a gene is expressed, the higher it will be on the y-axis. Um, so in this green cluster, the genes are uh, relatively low before the animal reproduces, and then they become enriched after mating and have sustained high expression um, throughout the maternal period. And so these genes include um, enzymes that make uh, steroids, um, as well as genes involved in uh, neurotransmission. Um, I'll show you the gene names, but uh, they're actually not that important for the purposes of this talk. Um, you can just focus on these uh, colored groupings here. And this other cluster has kind of like the inverse expression pattern than this green one. So enriched before the animal mates and then becomes depleted uh, during the maternal period um, and stays depleted throughout that entire time. Um, and these include uh, dopamine beta hydroxylase um, as well as many uh, neuropeptides. So at this point, we now had transcriptomic differences um, that coincide with the behavioral stages. And these are just two of the patterns that, uh, two of the clusters that we saw um, amongst many others. But from this, what we notice right away is that the genes found in the optic gland belong to multiple signaling classes. So again, neuropeptides, catecholamine, steroids. Um, and this is really intriguing to me because of the original classification or characterization of the optic gland as an analog to the pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland of, uh, of vertebrates only makes neuropeptides, certainly not steroids. And so we wanted to follow up on this to understand if the optic gland functions um, are, are more complex than previously appreciated. Okay, so um, along with the Kelowna lab at UIC, we pioneered a new uh, metabolomics techniques for extracting small molecule secretions from the optic glands of unmated and mated female octopuses. We found over 3,200 metabolites to be enriched or depleted in the maternal um, optic glands indicated by these circles here. And from these metabolites, we were able to piece together at least three cholesterol metabolizing pathways that synthesize um, different steroid hormones from the maternal optic glands. So uh, just to quickly summarize for you, in this blue pathway, we saw that the optic glands produce your typical sex steroids. Um, so for example, progesterone. In this green pathway here, um, we saw that the optic glands make a sterile metabolite called 7-DHC, which is actually very toxic when uh, accumulated in humans. Um, and finally, in this yellow pathway here, we identified um, these cholesterols that resemble mammalian bile acids, both in structure and in their synthetic steps. Um, these are really highly enriched in the maternal optic gland, but never before have they been implicated in uh, any reproductive functions. So this was a really exciting co collaboration um, because you know, it, uh, it confirmed our, our RNA sequencing results, um, but also uh, by kind of casting this super wide net and, and gathering all this data, we were able to um, pinpoint biosynthetic pathways of the optic gland for the very first time. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, we're now at this point where we're gathering, we're, we're gaining a lot of data that the optic glands are very neurochemically diverse. And so from here, of course, I want to know, you know, how does the structure of the optic gland, how does, um, how does the neuroanatomy support all of these, um, you know, hypothesized diverse functions? So to do this, um, I designed custom RNA probes uh, for these optic gland ligands, um, and I've been surveying their expression in the octopus um, nervous system using traditional in situ hybridization. And this really helps us get at um, localizing where these RNAs are expressed. Um, so starting from the very back of the brain, um, when we designed probes for our steroids, catecholamines, and neuropeptides, 
We found that at the very back of the octopus brain and octopus optic gland, um, we only found um, uh, regions that, uh, the, that were steroid positive, um, so that the steroid probes picked up. And so this kind of like moon-like structure is the optic lobe. And what we're paying attention to is in this orange square right here, this is the optic gland. And you know that the probe has found here because it's, uh, it's nice and dark compared to this um, un unlabeled tissue. As we move forward in the brain and in the optic gland, uh, we see that our probes for neuropeptides and catecholamines are now um, uh, uh, picking up the optic gland. Um, but here, the, the pattern, the expression pattern also looks different. So here, this is kind of like a solid fill, but um, in here, we see that the neuropeptides, as well as the catecholamines, only really pick out the outer rind of the optic gland, as well as some uh, internal subregions. And this pattern holds all the way to the front of the brain or the, um, the frontest part of the optic glands as well. So these data are, are highlighting to us that there might be distinct cellular regions within the optic gland that specialize in creating these different classes of signaling molecules that we found in our RNA sequencing data. So uh, in this very simplistic model, the back of the optic gland might make the steroids, and then the middle and the front of the optic glands might make the uh, neuropeptides and catecholamines. So this is ongoing work, and of course, um, nowhere near the resolution of uh, the Allen Institute's mouse and C2 resources, or um, so many of the resources that we saw today. But I do think that with um, collaborative teamwork between My Future Lab and others, that creating these standardized gene expression um, atlases and resources for the octopus is within reach. Um, and of course, using these classic techniques, so traditional in situ will be, um, this is a really solid foundation for establishing some of the new analytical techniques that we saw today in the octopus, such as uh, spatial transcriptomics. So we're in this um, renaissance period of, of octopus neuroscience, and these resources will really um, accelerate discovery in the octopus brain. So uh, just to sum up, with um, a lot of collaborative work and um, open science big data resources, including a sequence genome and transcriptomes and a metabolome, we were able to tie changes in adult behavior to the genes that control them, um, the pathways that they make up, and the cells in the optic gland that produce these genes. Um, and so we've come a long way in our understanding of how the octopus nervous system um, triggers death after mating. So there's a notable exception to this, uh, this, this pattern that I've described to you, and I wanna highlight it because it's a future direction of my lab. So um, I emphasize that octopuses are, are solitary and they mate once. Um, well, of course, there's an exception to this, and um, that would be this species here called um, Octopus trucii or the Lesser Pacific Striped Octopus. Um, these animals are uh, known to be very socially tolerant, so living very close to each other, um, and they can mate multiple times um, before dying. And recently, um, my colleagues at the Marine Biological Laboratory closed the life cycle on these animals, which means that um, for the first time, we have an octopus um, model that we can breed and um, you know, uh, house multiple generations of within the lab. So moving forward, um, my lab will continue to investigate the boom bust life cycles of these animals. We'll study how the neuroendocrine system in the species and other species of, of octopuses facilitate their survival, um, as well as uh, other behavioral and nervous system changes that accompany aging in this animal. Okay. So um, overall, I hope I've given you a preview of how much potential there is in invertebrate species for understanding uh, nervous system evolution and function and decline. Um, my lab opens in fall 2022, and senescence and death is our, um, our through line, our launching point for studying these animals. But of course, their brains and behaviors are, are so infinitely fascinating um, that there is much, much more to learn from them. So finally then, I just, oops, want to thank 
uh, the many people that were involved in this work. Um, my lab here at Princeton, uh, my graduate lab at Chicago, and um, I'm excited to take any questions. Thank you. Awesome, that was amazing talk, super fascinating. We got a lot of questions. Um, so I'm gonna group a couple of the questions that have to do with males particularly, mm -hmm. uh, such as, yeah, like um, <laughs> do male occurrences experience a similar rapid rate of decline after researching sexual um, maturity? Are there any specific to males? That's one question. So yeah, I guess we can start with that one. Sure, yeah. So in our study, we did not include males. And this is because um, I was doing this work in, in uh, Chicago at the time, we're landlocked, um, surprise. There are no uh, you know, Lake Michigan octopuses. So we got all of our octopuses from California. And if you capture a male, there's no way of telling if that animal has made it or not. Um, and so it would be really hard to kind of anchor that um, that individual to some developmental time point in its life, right? So has it made it, has it not? We can't really tell. However, the original um, paper from 1977, um, in which they glandectomized or removed the optic glands of octopuses, they did this in both males and females um, because they were out by the sea and they were able to. Um, and, uh, and they did notice similar really fast um, rapid decline as well. I do think that there will be some exciting um, sex differences in this because males can, although they do not often um, mate with more than one female. And so who knows, you know, maybe that first time triggers something that the second time doesn't. But also in this emerging species, you know, we'll really, really be able to dissect that down to a finer point. So that, yeah, no, that does sound exciting. There should sound be a lot of sex differences with these two uh, particular org system. So in the clinical questions, if an octopus never mates, do they just dramatically live longer then? Yeah, um, no. <laughs> so, um, so again, a, a challenging question to study in the lab alone. Um, in the lab, uh, the octopuses will also die. And um, anecdotally, or I should say, you know, from personal experience, they don't die in the same kind of spectacular fashion that we see. So truly here I'm studying post-mating death, um, but this question definitely gets at the point that death is a, is a really complex process in general. So non-post-mating death also happens, um, but it looks uh, more similar to kind of like the, the fading or shutting down of systems um, that we see in death and in other species, rather than kind of like a ramping up of a signaling system that triggers death. Um, and then of course, in the ocean, um, we would probably expect that these animals would be predated because um, they're, you know, they're, they're uh, soft bodies and uh, uh, delicious um, uh, prey for a lot of marine mammals. And then I guess I can follow up on question. We had a question about it's you know tough to study what's done in the lab versus what's done in the ocean. But some of that behavior of hitting its glass wall is there a similar you see in the wild? Yeah. So luckily, um, because of the um, you know amazing community of of um, like hobbyists and aquarists and divers, um, we we do have anecdotal evidence that these are these senescent behaviors, these decline behaviors are are observed in um, octopuses in the ocean. I would say that the exception there would be we probably wouldn't observe them for as long of a time because the animals would be um, predated. So basically. Um, you can think of an octopus as like a snail without a shell. And so as soon as they leave the den, abandon their eggs, you know, engage in any of those behaviors, they become really, really vulnerable. Um, so to either to physical um, injury um, caused by themselves or uh, death caused by other animals. That's a great analogy of the octopus over shell. Never thought about it that way. Since <laughs> they're soft bodied. Yeah. Um, all right, so switching a little bit more to transcriptomics, but the two clusters you highlighted show a dissociation between non-mated versus all the other stages. Were there any clusters selectively increased or decreased specifically in one of those post-mating stages? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And just for the purposes of the talk, I, um, I didn't highlight that. But um, for example, at the, at the transition point between um, feeding and fasting in the maternal octopuses, we see that um, insulin signaling factors um, become enriched. So yeah, it, there's definitely a lot of complexity there and I just highlighted um, some, some uh, greatest hits. Awesome, and then a little bit two-part question, but where in the brains of females is the male DNA 
found? Is it in fragments? Like what purpose does the storage of male DNA serve? Does it prevent an allergic type of reaction to male DNA? Is it related to SLE? Um, okay, I think, okay, so um, question asker, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, I think that this is talking about storage of sperm in the octopus. And so, um, so the way that octopuses me is that male octopuses will reach an arm into their mantle and they'll grab a sperm packet. Um, and then they will hand it off to the female. Sometimes they will insert their arm into the female's mantle, but uh, sometimes the female will eat them or attack them. And so um, they'll use a variety of, of techniques for that. And then the female takes that and she stores it in, a, in a, um, an organ um, called the spermatheca. And um, as the eggs pass from the ovary and are deposited, that's how they get um, fertilized. They just pass through the spermatheca and they get fertilized that way with the with the male genetic um, information. Okay, um, another question. Is the optic gland equivalent to a combo of the pituitary and the adrenal gland in this case? Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I would love to explore this. So, um, so far the optic gland has really only been studied with um, an eye towards reproductive functions. But as this question is highlighting and as our RDC um, uh, data and, and metabolomics data is highlighting, it's very possible that um, the, the functions are a lot more diverse um, and perhaps, you know, just haven't been picked up on because the behavioral, um, the behavioral consequences of that, you know, we didn't have the techniques to really measure that or observe that before. Um, but I, I think that's a really fascinating question and I'm, I'm eager to follow up on that. And then here's another question. So sorry if I say the word wrong, not familiar with octopus terminology, but is there a way to conclude if the diversification of cluster protocaterins in octopuses is independent yet equivalent processes to the one in vertebrates? Yeah, so it is an independent expansion of, um, of protocaterins. Yeah, and um, we highlight that if you're interested in that work, uh, we highlight that in the genome paper and um, I have a uh, a paper out there as well on, on the octopus protocaterins. I think we have time for one last question, which can relate to that genome is so like for like, you know, non-traditional model organisms, how do you come up with what's the wild type or, you know, the standard when you do all this behavior test? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question and definitely a major priority of the entire field. Um, so to that, I would, I would bring your attention to a uh, paper, Alberton 2012, that talks about how will the cephalopod community prioritize genomics and transcriptomics. Um, but when we sequence this genome, part of it bec was because the behavioral attributes and physical attributes of um, the California two-spot octopus made it pretty attractive for laboratory research. So they're found off the coast of California. They're very, very plentiful. Um, they're relatively small. So an adult will be like about the size of my fist, which means that you can keep them in glass aquaria. Um, we, you know, the these tools are really only useful if people can use them, right? So you, we, we didn't want to choose an, a, a species that um, might be very, very charismatic, but too large to actually house, um, house in, in facilities. Um, so those were some of the reasons why that was chosen. And then um, there are sequencing efforts underway for a whole other range of, of cephalopod uh, models now. Awesome. And I think with that, we don't have any more live questions, but I want to remind everyone, feel free to submit questions to the panelists for any of this talk or any of the previous talks. Um, our panelists will be able to answer them at any time. And so that, with that, we conclude our public um, webinar portion of the event. Um, everyone, yeah, welcome. Uh, submit your questions to the Brain Map Community Forum, which the link will be dropped right now. Um, and then we also want to just give another th shout out and thank you to all our NGLs uh, who spoke today. We are very excited for the work you will do, and we'll see you in the next three years with your partnership with NGLs. I want to remind Allen Institute employees and NGLs, we are going to begin the roundtable and poster sessions in, um, next, um, which is a separate Zoom link. So um, make sure you click on that. And NGLs, if you did not register, it's okay. You can just walk in for any of the roundtable sessions you like. And with that, we hope everyone has a great rest of the day. See you tomorrow at 9 a.m. specific time for our second day.